So I have some really big news. It's the best project I've ever worked on. I'm thrilled to announce the launch of a groundbreaking project I've been working on with Red Tower Entertainment. It's an honor to present our new show, Monster Myth. I've been collaborating with the co-producer of Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. We dive deep into first-hand accounts of creature encounters. Many of our witnesses come forward with tangible evidence of their incredible experiences. To get a glimpse of what's in store, check out the trailer for Monster Myth. Find us on YouTube or simply click the link below. In the middle of the night, I was kind of jolted awake by a sound, a sound I'll never, ever forget. It was unlike anything I've ever heard in the woods, and I've been in the woods a lot. something moving in the trees ahead. It was too big to be a bird. Boomer started growling something fierce, backing up towards me. That's when I knew we weren't dealing with their average force crew. these large, glowing red eyes. I worked for a while as a hunting guide in Northwest Montana. It's pretty rough country up there. Easy to get yourself in trouble. I made most of my money doing guided elk hunts on horseback. Weekend warriors will pay a pretty penny to get a Montana elk. Granted, I usually have to babysit them the entire time, but money is money. When I'm not doing hunting trips, I do a little bit of work here and there. I've worked on ranches from time to time, but the fish and game people have had me helping with a wildlife study the last couple of years. The terrain is too tough for the ATVs, so they need horses. I never thought I'd end up working for the government, but I can't complain too much. I get to spend my days tracking in the wilderness, and I don't have to babysit city hunters. I got a call one day at 4 a.m. from the Fish and Game office, asking me to get down there as soon as possible with my horses. They wouldn't say why over the phone, just that there was some sort of emergency. I loaded up three horses into the trailer and headed down the mountain. When I got to the office, there were about a dozen black SUVs in the parking lot with government plates. My first thought was that I was going to jail for tax fraud. I had taken quite a few hunting jobs over the years for cash and thought it was about to catch up with me. One of the men approached me and asked me to come inside. He told me to leave my cell phone in my truck and patted me down. Of course. I had a knife on my belt, but that didn't seem to matter to them. He told me he had heard that I was the best tracker in the area and that I didn't mind working for cash. I guess he could sense my nervousness because he told me to relax, that this had nothing to do with taxes. He said there was an invasive species that escaped and got loose in the area. It had been fatally wounded and the body had to be packed out or else it posed a threat to the native animals. None of that made any sense to me at all, but the man handed me a box with $30,000 cash inside and a satellite phone and asked me if I would take the job. I asked what kind of animal I was looking for, and he just said that I'd know it when I saw it. They said it had been shot about 12 times, but miraculously had enough strength to escape into the forest for a quiet death. They took me to the location of Last Blood, and that was that. I was on my own. Before they left me, I asked why they hadn't gotten tracking dogs. There was quite a bit of blood on the ground at the site, and a good dog would have an easy time of following it. The man said they already tried dogs. I told him a dog could follow this track easy as day. 
And he said, it's not that the dogs couldn't do the job. It's that they wouldn't. I started thinking that $30,000 might not even be worth what I was getting into. But I really needed the money, so I set out on my way. The trail was easy enough to follow, but it was in rough country, so it took us the better part of the day to find the beast. I'll save you the details of me bushwhacking my way through the wilderness with three horses. But I started at 7 a.m. and I found the creature somewhere around 7 p.m. This thing was bleeding out all the way and still managed to make it this far through some of the roughest terrain in the country. Whatever it was, it had my respect. I found it lying dead in the woods. It was a big pile of gray fur. I couldn't see its face right away. It had tried to conceal itself in the underbrush, but it was just too large. Animals do that when they know they are dying. They try to hide. I know I'm a hunter, but it always saddens me to see that. I don't like seeing them suffer. If you can't drop an animal in its tracks, don't take the shot. I got my gun out and approached the carcass. It looked dead, but I wasn't certain. I still had no idea what it was. It was bigger than a horse, but it had a long coat. I rolled it over and it was indeed dead. That's when I finally got to examine its face. Invasive species, my ass. It looked like a wolf mixed with a bear. Its head and ears were dog-like, but its snout was shorter and more rounded. Its front legs appeared to be longer than its hind legs, so I would guess it might stand like a hyena or something similar. I was totally dumbfounded. This was no creature I'd ever seen or heard of. It was either some sort of experiment or somebody thawed out, one of those prehistoric monsters out of the ice in Siberia. I called them on the satellite phone and told them I found it, but there was no way I was going to be able to pack it out in one piece. I couldn't drag it through the mountains, so either I was going to have to cut it up, or they were going to have to come and get it. They weren't thrilled with my idea, but there wasn't much choice. It was a bloody mess, and they didn't want me leaving any parts behind, so I couldn't feel dress it either. It took all three horses to pack out the body. The government guys with their black SUVs met me on the edge of the forest. They took the remains and loaded them into a van. I went up to the lead officer that had been talking with me the most and said, I don't suppose I can ask what that thing was, can I? He said no, but he handed me an envelope with some more cash in it. And that was that. They left town just as quickly as they had arrived. I went back to my job with fish and game and nobody ever spoke about it again. I kept a little piece of hide from the creature, but I figure I'd have those black SUVs surrounding my house if I ever tried to DNA test it. I'm Jack. I work as a forest ranger in the outskirts of California, and I'm here to recount something I experienced on the night of June 30, 2021. On that day, I was deep into the woods for a routine survey. My job includes ensuring the trails are clear and safe for hikers. As I moved further, I felt a sudden chill, as if someone had just cranked up the air conditioning. The woods became eerily quiet. Even the usually chatty birds seemed to hold their breath. This silence was broken by an intermittent low growl, more like a predator communicating, not entirely normal in these parts of the woods. Suddenly, there it was, standing at a distance in the clearing. It was partially illuminated by my flashlight, a figure about eight feet tall with a massive chest and wide shoulders. The creature was standing upright, resembling a human in its posture but its legs. They were almost canine, as you would find on a dog. My heart pounded in my chest as I took in its features. It had a long snout with a double row of teeth and fangs visible even from my distance. Its ears were pointy, and the face. There was something unsettling, demonic about it, like a hyena, but far more intimidating. Its fur was a dark blend. A mix of black, brown, dark brown, and gray all interwoven in a matted mess. The smell that came off the creature was unbearable. It was a potent mixture of wet dog and the stench of garbage. There were other smells too, like urine, rotting meat, blood, and a hint of sulfur. All these, combined with the ominous low growl it was making, sent chills down my spine. I remember stepping back slowly, not wanting to provoke it. 
My boots crunched lightly on the dried leaves beneath me, the noise loud in the relative silence. The creature's intense gaze followed my movements. There was an intelligence there, a sort of awareness I didn't typically associate with wild animals. A prickle of dread crawled up my spine as our eyes remained locked. Suddenly, it tilted its head to the side in a way that reminded me disconcertingly of a dog's curious gesture. That's when it opened its mouth, showing off its double row of teeth, glistening under the soft moonlight filtering through the dense canopy. It was a menacing display, one that screamed danger. Then it let out a guttural growl, a sound so deep and reverberating that I could feel it in my bones. It was a sound I had never heard before, one that seemed to echo around the quiet forest, bouncing off the trees. The hair on my arm stood on end as I continued to maintain a safe distance, never turning my back on the creature. I couldn't tell if it was threatened by me or simply curious, but it didn't move towards me. Instead, it continued to observe me with an almost casual interest. I could see the muscles under its matted fur ripple with restrained power, the hump on its back becoming more pronounced as it straightened its wide shoulders. After what felt like an eternity, the creature howled. The sound was high and haunting, piercing the quiet night with its eerie resonance. Then, as if satisfied with our encounter, the creature spun on its dog-like legs and disappeared into the undergrowth, leaving me alone in the clearing. I stood there heart pounding for several moments, replaying the encounter in my mind. The chilling memory of its demonic hyena-like face and the nauseating smell it left behind in the clearing. It was a mix of wet dog, garbage, urine, rotting, meat, blood, and sulfur. The odors were so pungent that even after the creature was gone, the scent lingered, a stark reminder of what had transpired. That night, I found it hard to shake off the experience. The dread I felt wasn't something that could be easily dismissed. Every crack of a twig or rustle of leaves brought me back to that encounter, making me constantly look over my shoulder. The sight and smell of that creature stayed with me, a tangible reminder of the unknown lurking in our familiar surroundings. In the immediate aftermath, I did what I could to rationalize what I had seen. I made reports, went over every detail trying to put it into perspective but nothing in my years of training had prepared me for such a creature. Even now, the memory leaves a lingering impression, a sense of unease that reasserts itself each time I walk the same path where I had that unforgettable encounter. So far, I've kept this all to myself, but writing it down and hoping you'll tell my story has really helped me. Thank you for your time. I'm Jed, a ranch hand from Montana. In my line of work, you come across all sorts of wildlife, but nothing quite prepared me for what I experienced a few weeks back. So there I was, late one evening, heading out to check on the cattle. They'd been acting skittish lately, not like their normal selves. That night, the air had peculiar stench. Honestly, it made me gag a bit. As a ranch hand, my daily duties vary widely. Most days, I'm up at the crack of dawn feeding the cattle, mending fences and maintaining our equipment. I've always enjoyed the rhythm of ranch life, the simplicity of it, and the close relationship I've developed with the land and the animals. Over the years, I've become quite familiar with the local wildlife. I can tell you the distinct howl of a coyote from a mile away or identify a bear's tracks in the mud. I've encountered rattlesnakes, deer, even the occasional bobcat. But nothing in my years on the ranch could have prepared me for what I experienced that night. The odd behavior of the cattle, the strange smell in the air, and those eerie sounds, it was as if the rules of the wilderness I knew so well were being rewritten. Whatever was out there wasn't just unfamiliar, it was totally alien to my years of experience. The discomfort of this fact was unsettling, to say the least. It wasn't just the cows and the smell that were off. I started hearing strange sounds echoing across the fields, a mix of loud yelps and growls that I'd never heard before. I thought it might have been some coyote or a wolf, but the pitch was all wrong. Sure, I've heard coyotes yelp and wolves growl, but this was different. 
The sounds were low and guttural, almost as if they were echoing from deep within a cavernous chest. The yelps weren't the high-pitched calls of a coyote, but more of a howl, modulating between pitches in a way that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. As for the growls, they weren't the warning snarls you'd hear from a bear or a mountain lion. These were more resonant, echoing across the plains with depth, an intensity that left me feeling chilled to the bone. The sounds had a whooping quality too, almost like a primate call, but distorted and much, much louder. It was as if nature herself had struck a discordant note, one that left me deeply unsettled. Anyway, I kept on with my rounds, but strange occurrences didn't stop. Then suddenly, I saw it, standing just beyond the tree line. This thing was massive, easily nine feet tall, with large shoulders and a huge chest. It had beady black eyes that seemed to glint in the moonlight, and it had this cone-shaped head atop a body with no apparent neck. The moment I saw it, I noticed its movements were not what you'd expect from a typical wildlife encounter. Most animals, upon seeing a human, would either attack if they felt threatened or bolt in the other direction. But this creature, it just stood there calmly, almost as if it was studying me. Its movements were surprisingly fluid. It swayed slightly, in a sort of rhythm shifting its massive weight from one foot to another. Its beady black eyes never left me, watching my every move. I couldn't tell whether it was curious, cautious, or sizing me up. But one thing was clear, it wasn't afraid of me, not in the least. I was in its territory and it knew it. The creature's stoic demeanor and unsettling gaze, those were the things that truly left me speechless. It was a silent standoff, one that the creature seemed to be in full control of, its calmness in stark contrast to the turmoil I felt inside. I'm not gonna lie, Donovan, I froze. I've never been one to scare easy, but seeing something like that, something so unexplainable, it scared me. As I stood there, locked in that eerie standoff, my emotions ran wild. The initial shock of encountering this massive, unknown creature was overwhelming. I felt my heart pounding in my chest like a drum, and a cold wave of realization washed over me. I was in a situation I had no control over. But after a few moments, the shock started to fade, replaced by a strange mix of fear and fascination. Despite every instinct telling me to run, I found myself rooted to the spot. I was captivated by this creature that seemed like something out of a fairy tale. I didn't stick around to see what would happen next. I hightailed it out of there and didn't stop until I reached the safety of my house. In the days following the encounter, I noticed a distinct change in the cattle. They were much more agitated, often huddling together and showing signs of distress. Several nights, I could hear them lowing in the field their sounds echoing a sense of unease that resonated with my own. As for me, I was more on edge too. I found myself checking the fields more frequently, especially at dusk and dawn. I installed some additional floodlights around the barn and kept a closer eye on the perimeter fences. The tranquility that I once felt working, the land was replaced with a heightened sense of alertness, a change that has stuck with me. I also reached out to a local wildlife expert sharing my experience in the hope of identifying the creature. He was as baffled as I was, though he suggested it might be an unusually large bear or a misidentified moose. But the description didn't match and we both knew it. To this day, there's a part of me that constantly wonders about that night. I find myself looking over my shoulder more often, alert to the sounds of the wilderness. Anyway, that's my story. I thought your audience might get kick out of it. Maybe someone out there can shed some light on what I saw that night. When I was 17, my high school sponsored an end-of-year trip to New York City. We had spent the day sightseeing. After going all around the city just doing the usual stuff, we were finally driving back to our hotel. I was listening to music on my headphones. I didn't really feel like socializing much with anybody. To be honest, I was in kind of an irritable mood in general back then. Also, my class had gotten mixed up with some other people I didn't really know, and my classmates were all on the lower deck of the bus. 
I was stuck sitting next to some loud, obnoxious kid. He kept fidgeting around and yelling to his buddies across the bus. Anyway, I'm sitting there listening to my music trying to tune out all the irritating people. I was looking out the window as we were driving through what I would describe as a semi-industrial part of town. Just a lot of plain buildings, warehouses, and stuff. I think the school got a deal on a cheap, out-of-the-way hotel. We were almost back and I was making sure I had everything. The kid next to me elbowed me accidentally and I turned toward him to tell him to watch out. And then as soon as I turned my face back to the window, I saw something move in my peripheral vision. It was something black and shadowy. We were in front of the hotel now, but we were stopped at a red light. We still had to go around the corner to the parking area. At that same moment, this feeling of complete coldness enveloped my whole body. I got this deep, panicky feeling and I looked straight in front of me, not wanting to look back out through the window. It's hard to explain how it made me feel. I've never had that kind of feeling of desolation for seemingly no reason. I felt scared, but also part of me thought I was being really silly. It sounds ridiculous, but it really took a lot of strength for me to gather enough courage to look outside the window again. I forced myself, and of course I saw the usual scene. But then something moved in my periphery again. The hotel had this high wall in front of it, like maybe 12 feet high. Something was moving on top of it. And at that point, I think my mouth literally dropped open while I stared. It wasn't just a glimpse this time. I was staring at it for however long it took for the light to turn green and the bus to start driving again. Like I said, it was this very dense, moving darkness. A real, shadowy, subtle movement that you wouldn't realize was there unless you caught the movement at just the right time. I want to describe it as something like the way the flames of a fire move with the fumes and the flame and the smoke, but it was absolutely black. It was getting dark outside, but I was still able to discern all its body parts and movements. It was walking on the wall of the building. It was on all fours and the back legs were bent backward. It walked along the wall across the side of the building. At that point, it turned its head straight toward me. It had a demonic face with red eyes and it had horns. I literally had to rip my eyes away from looking at it and force myself to stare ahead of me. I was a mess. I was shaking and felt like I was going to have a heart attack, and I was freezing cold all over. That feeling of dread was something completely unfamiliar to me. It was unimaginable. I felt like my mind was screaming because it had witnessed something. It knew it shouldn't have, as if I had seen into another plane of existence. It was completely alien to what was happening around me on the bus. I felt like I was forced to look back and it caught my sight immediately and stared straight into my eyes for what seemed like forever. Then it jumped up to the first level of the roof and the bus started driving away. It's so hard to convey this, but the experience had seemed to go on and on forever, even though it had to have been only 30 seconds or so. I started coming back to my senses and gradually tuned back in to all the noise and laughing around me. Not one person had sensed anything wrong. But then the kid next to me looked over and I must have looked deranged. He asked me if anything was wrong and if I needed the teacher. All I could do was mutter that I was fine. I mean, can you imagine trying to describe what I had just gone through? I really did not want to go in the hotel knowing that thing was present somewhere. I couldn't sleep that night and I had a terrible headache for the rest of the trip. I was a mess and couldn't wait to go home. Since then, I've had this phobia about noticing things in my peripheral vision, like something is going to creep out from some hellish alternate world. I understand it seems crazy and unbelievable, and I haven't felt comfortable talking about it until I listen to some of the stuff on your channel. I've wanted to tell one of my friends, but I feel like they would just shrug me off. And I don't want it to isolate me from people. It had such an unsettling effect on me that I actually started wanting to be around people a lot more than I ever used to. Anyway, thanks for letting me share it here. My family used to live in an apartment in the poor side of the city. It was built in the 50s and had long corridors and old wooden doors. The building itself was interesting, despite it not being in the best shape. There was a certain historical feel to it that was unique. 
On my 10th birthday, my mom got me a huge book of ghost stories, which were my absolute favorite. My younger brother and I loved to read stories from the book. It was part of our nighttime routine. As strange as it sounds, the ghost stories always made us relaxed and ready for sleep. It's almost like hearing the misfortune of others made us realize that our own misfortunes weren't that unique and that people aren't as different from each other as we think. Anyway, we were reading ghost stories and mom let us know it was time for bed. Mom tucked us in and kept the door slightly open to let the light from her room spill into the hallway. This warded off the overwhelming darkness, which my younger brother was desperately afraid of. As I lay on my bed, my gaze wandered around the small room, finally resting on the door. Suddenly, a creepy figure darted across the hallway, its swift movements leaving me staring at the door with fear. I blinked, convincing myself it was just my overactive imagination, but my certainty shattered when my brother's voice pierced the silence. Mom, was that you? Our mother emerged from her room, her face paled by the sudden terror in my brother's voice. She scoured the entire apartment with a baseball bat, probing every nook and cranny. But the creature, or whatever it was, seemed to have vanished, leaving no traces behind. The entity remained elusive, and the weeks that followed were eerily calm the quiet punctuated by our hushed discussions and speculations about that night. Over time, we confided in our close friends and extended family. Their reactions ranged from incredulous to sympathetically skeptical. We heard suggestions of everything from sleep-induced hallucinations to the existence of supernatural beings. But we both knew better. And then suddenly, the thing returned. A soft, high-pitched giggle echoed from the hallway. Each hair on the back of my neck was standing to attention. The unmistakable sound of something small scampering down the hallway followed the giggle. By the time my heart began to regulate its frantic beating, I found the courage to peek through the door. My eyes widened in shock as I watched the tiny shadow scampering down the hallway. Its form was clearer this time, more tangible and dreadfully real. This second encounter was brief. Much like the first, but it was enough to equally reignite our fear and curiosity. It was real, it was here, and it seemed to have taken a liking to our humble home. And then later in the week, it happened again. The door to our room creaked open slowly, revealing the shadowy figure. The intruder was there, standing still this time. It was terrifyingly strange with its miscule, wiry body, black as pitch. Its eyes gleamed with an unholy red glow in the darkness. Frightened yet determined, I managed to croak out, Who are you? What do you want? In response, the creature merely cocked its head, a terrifying grin splitting its face before disappearing. We didn't sleep that night or for many nights following. Instead, we dove into research, attempting to name our uninvited guest. The clues finally fell into place when we stumbled upon a description that seemed to mirror our experiences. An imp, mischievous, quick, and fond of playing tricks on humans. We knew then what we were dealing with, and somehow having a name for our terror made it a bit less daunting. Still, our lives had been irrevocably changed. We had stared into the eyes of the supernatural, had our skepticism challenged, and were left questioning everything we thought we knew about the world around us. A paranormal encounter that started with a love for ghost stories had turned our lives into an actual ghost story, a tale we would live to tell but wish we had never experienced. The imp's visitation ceased as abruptly as they began. The apartment returned to its old rhythm. The long corridors were just normal corridors again. The wooden doors no longer hid any unworldly secrets. The unnerving silence of the nights was replaced by the familiar city noises we had grown accustomed to. The world had seemingly righted itself. Yet, we knew it was different. We were now different. We were no longer just the two kids living in the old apartment building on the poor side of the city relishing in ghost stories. We were the two kids who would live a ghost story. Sleep which had once been elusive, returned but it was no longer the carefree slumber of our innocent days. 
It was the weary sleep of those who had seen things they could not unsee. But with time, even those anxieties began to fade. As years passed, we grew older and our lives branched out in unexpected ways. My brother found solace in science and the logical world where everything had an explanation, a purpose. I found comfort in history and literature, where the inexplicable was accepted and even celebrated. But our diverging paths always met at one intersection. The experiences of our childhood shaped us and molded our worldview. While my brother took the rationale scientific route, my journey led me down the path of exploration. I was determined to understand and unearth the truths of the world that were considered unworldly. Every creak of an old floorboard, every sudden rush of cold air, every strange shadow in the corner of my eye became a possible connection to the world that had briefly opened itself up to us as kids. And even though that little creature never visited again, its memory was a constant companion. Our humble house in the city's poor side was a distant memory, but its influence was always there. We became adults living with one foot in the seen world, and one in the unseen, our minds now open to the unbelievable truths of our extraordinary world. Back when I was a kid in the 80s, my dad took me and my older brother on a long camping trip. It was one of those spontaneous decisions. He packed up his truck with everything we would need and off we went. We drove for what seemed like hours until we got to some woods where he said he'd stayed with Grandpa and Uncle Billy when he was a kid. We set up the tent and my brother and I wanted to make a fire. That's the part we always look forward to. And anyway, the sun would be setting soon and we were getting pretty hungry. My brother and I kept talking about how much we wanted hot dogs the whole time. So my brother and I headed into the trees to grab some kindling before it got too dark. We must have gone further than we had intended. As you know, you see one tree, you've seen them all, which can be confusing. That's kind of just how the woods are to an unexperienced woodsman. And we were just kids, so we didn't really know any better. After going in too far, we became a little disoriented. But Jason, my older brother, was sure he knew the way out. I remember him kind of panicking a little bit. But he was still trying to reassure me that everything was okay and that he was going to lead us out of this mess. I do remember it being really quiet. All you could hear was the sound of our sneakers crunching on the leaves and twigs underfoot. It was unnaturally quiet, kind of unnerving to say the least. All of a sudden, Jason stopped very abruptly and I dang near bumped straight into him. I even asked him what's the big idea. He ordered me to be quiet peering around. I wondered what he'd seen. His eyes seemed fixated on something. Something that was just beyond my vision. Something that I could not see. What was it? Possibly a bear? I know they're around here. Dad always told us about them. And even at that young age, I knew running into one would be bad news. Now most of the time, bears will usually run away. But if you encounter a mama bear with her cubs nearby, you would better run for the hills or try and climb a tree. But then again, bears climb trees. So could it have been a coyote or even a wolf that he was looking at? But I didn't think we had bears, coyotes, or wolves out where we were. Then I saw it. I'm not afraid to tell you that I peed my pants as I clung onto my brother for dear life. I was pretty sure that we were as good as dead. What we saw standing amongst the trees on two legs, not even 10 feet away from us, was what I can only describe as a wolf man or dog man. It had the head of a Doberman pincher and a very sleek muscular body. It was very toned. And it had very, very short hair or fur, short enough that we could see each individual rippling muscle underneath. It must have been well over seven feet tall. Because my dad at the time was a tall guy, probably 6'1 or 6'2, and this thing stood taller than him. It was also much wider than him. It was like a really muscular man. My brain instantly thought of the way men looked in those bodybuilding competitions. Really wide at the shoulders like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But again, the head was unmistakably that of a Doberman Pinscher, but larger. Almost too large. 
like it wasn't proportioned with its body. And all I remember seeing were white teeth amongst the darkness and yellow glowing eyes. It bared its teeth at us and howled, but it wasn't like a howl in a traditional sense like a wolf does. This was an ungodly, unholy howl, like a distorted human yell mixed with that of a painful cry of a dog. It was awful. Run. Jason had yelled at me and we hot-toted out of there quicker than we ever moved before. We learned as we got older, you're not supposed to ever run from a predator. But at this age and being caught up in total fear, we had no other option. This thing surprisingly didn't give chase to us, and somehow luck was on our side. We came tearing out of the woods and straightened my dad's arms. He had heard the cry too and was coming and looking for us. He thought we had really been hurt by the sounds of it. When we told him what we had seen, he made us get into the tent to sit down and collect ourselves. He didn't seem too concerned, so as I look back on it, I wonder if he believed us. After we told him all the details, he asked if we could show him where it happened. So, a little later, we went back into the woods with a flashlight and a shotgun. Obviously, I felt much safer with my father, even though I did stay tucked behind him, and held onto his shirt while peeking forward the entire time. Of course, we didn't see anything not with him, and he never saw anything out of the ordinary either. At least not that he told us. But you can imagine, because of that event, we didn't get an ounce of sleep that night, and we left the first thing the following morning. My brother and I kept talking to him about it, even the following morning, which is why we left. I can recall my father getting kind of annoyed with us because he thought we had just had a mistaken identity of a bear or possibly a wolf and totally blew it out of proportion. He seemed frustrated with having to listen to us. And it doesn't help that kids have a natural tendency to exaggerate what they've seen. So that's why I believe that he did not believe our story. But I think others here might have sympathy for us. I understand that it's going to be especially hard to believe my story. I don't have the credentials to prove that I'm a reliable source, and I don't have any proof of what I've seen. I'm not a secret agent or a member of the military. I'm a contractor. I receive a plan for the development of a structure, and I execute that plan. I've been doing it long enough that I'm now a member of a small group who receives exclusive contracts from the United States government. Recently, some of the work commissioned from us by the government has been released to the public. If it wasn't for the accessibility of these documents, I wouldn't be talking. Before this, it was classified. But now, anybody can know this story. The exposure of my identity isn't at the same level of risk it once was. We were hired nearly a decade ago to build a rotunda on a United States military base in South Korea. The scale of the building was incredible. The pay being offered for our participation and our silence was equally impressive. Needless to say, we all agreed to come aboard this project. We hadn't been tempted to violate any privacy agreements in the past. We didn't care about the things we'd see or the purpose of the buildings we were constructing. In our minds, being silent was just typical military protocol. We figured they were just building structures to store weapons. Structures to protect our country's assets. But we soon found out that this one was different. This rotunda was being designed to conceal something. Something that was already there. An object of some sort. When we arrived on site, we discovered an area roughly 500 feet in diameter, closed off by caution tape, and covered by a layer of heavy tarps. Armed guards dotted the outline of that circle every 50 feet or so. The building we were erecting was being assembled on top of this object. The guards would stay inside even as we put the wall together and built the ceiling overhead. For a while, this was merely another job. Tensions were high with all of the security around us, but we managed to carve a typical routine out of the absurd. Then came the storm. South Korea is no stranger to tropical disasters. One day out of nowhere, one of those tropical storms came in from the sea. It was challenging our resolve and the stability of our work. We hurried to secure the elements of the building we had already assembled. Obviously, we didn't want to lose weeks of work. No one could have prepared us for a win that day. Not even the military was ready for it. 
Sure enough, the unrelenting gusts ripped open a fraction of those tarps. Although none of us would admit it out loud, we saw what was under there. It was a vehicle of some kind, identifiable only by prong-like legs that jutted out from below the massive metal. It was clear that those legs could be lowered and retracted, similar to the wheels of a plane, but it was far too large to be anything man-made. It was too large to even imagine it in motion. How could anyone power something like that? Something so huge. It was a disc nearly as long as a football field. A single haunting apparatus that shocked our minds. There were no seams in the metal. No obvious places where the metal panels would have been welded shut. We saw a glass dome at the top. Something like a cockpit, maybe. Looking at it turned our stomachs when we realized what was happening. The military hurriedly covered the craft back up grabbing at the tarps as the wind whipped them around. They were panicked that the craft had been revealed. That was obvious by the way they were acting and the looks on their faces. They ushered us off the base and assaulted us with questions. We all played a convincing degree of stupid, saying we hadn't seen anything. Eventually the storm passed and we all returned to finish our work. We were quietly, only periodically giving each other quick glances with knowing looks in our eyes. However, there were no more glimpses of the craft, but we did notice additional members of security on site. After the incident, fleets of men in black suits had joined the perimeter. These men stared at us as we worked, and there was always one off in the distance atop a tower with his eyes on us too. I imagine they were listening as well, making sure we didn't talk to each other. All of us silently agreed to finish that job pretending nothing out of the ordinary had happened. I think we all suspected that an outburst would lead to severe repercussions. To be honest, I wasn't sure if we'd be allowed out of South Korea with our lives intact. But eventually the job ended and we were sent home. All of us were welcomed by the ambient static of wiretaps in our phones and by idling vehicles on our streets. Our job ended, but theirs had just begun. They had to watch us to make sure, I guess. They had to be positive that we weren't going to expose them before they were ready to spin the truth to their benefit. And recently, that's what's happening. The information is flying under the radar, but among declassified documents are claims that the military has been performing duties like this in order to keep people safe. But they're leaving something out of those reports. They're excluding the details of that cockpit, of what we saw that made us all feel sick. Under the tarps, inside the craft, something was alive. Something turned its head on the other side of the glass and looked out at us. Its face was warped into some nightmarish scream. Its jaw was extended and its eyes were the size of oranges. It looked like it was screaming, muted by the glass and the tarps and the wind. Whatever it was, it was trapped. And it didn't look like it was trapped in there for our own protection. It looked like a prisoner. And maybe that's the detail that exposes everything. Maybe that's the detail that proves we were really there. Maybe those government agents will appear back on my street someday, and they will walk right up to my door and drag me away. It wouldn't surprise me, I guess. But there's always the other option, isn't there? There's another possibility. There's a chance that the next thing they expose is the final piece of the puzzle. The final piece of truth there's a chance they'll admit that they don't just have an aircraft in their possession. Maybe it's only a matter of time before they admit that they have life forms here too. Life forms that we don't understand they're trapped here on our planet. That's right. It's only a matter of time. My name is James and I work as a game warden for the Fish and Wildlife Service in Oregon. I've spent over a decade immersed in the wilderness, but an incident a few weeks ago was absolutely unique in my career. During a standard patrol, I found myself deep in a secluded section of the forest that's usually void of human activity. I often relished its peaceful isolation, but that day, the atmosphere felt different. My role as a game warden entails lengthy periods in the wilderness, monitoring wildlife behavior checking for poacher activity, and ensuring visitor safety. It's a demanding yet fulfilling job where no two days are the same, and because of this I knew something was off. 
That's why the day of the incident was so disconcerting. The usual serene quiet of the forest was replaced by an almost tangible tension. The smell of decay was out of place in the fresh woodland air. The usual tranquility was replaced with an ominous dread. As I delved deeper into the woods, an unusual smell became apparent. It was the scent of decay, so strong that it left a bitter taste in my mouth. I've encountered the smell of deceased animals before, but this was different, more powerful and unnerving. Alongside this, I spotted broken branches and disturbed soil, suggesting something large had passed through. With each step, the dread increased. I felt a warning in my gut, telling me something was awry. It was an odd sensation, a mixture of anticipation and fear unlike anything I'd experienced in my years of patrolling these woods. Then, in a clearing, I saw it, a towering creature, roughly nine feet tall. My mind grappled with the sight, trying to reconcile what I was seeing with my understanding of the natural world. The creature towered above me, looming in a manner that was both awe-inspiring and intimidating. It was an uncanny combination of familiar elements and grotesque distortions that challenged my reality. The creature's skeletal body, framed by the stark outline of a deer skull, was just like what you'd expect in a horror story. My heart throbbed heavily in my chest, and its beats echoed loudly in my ears. It was a rhythm that was a grim reminder of the perilous situation I was in. I felt a sharp, icy jolt of adrenaline surge through my veins, awakening every cell in my body. A survival instinct triggered by the undeniable presence of danger. Despite the years of training I had under my belt, nothing had prepared me for an encounter like this. My body seemed to move independently of my will, rendering me immobile. I was anchored to the spot, like a sailor caught in the gaze of a siren, incapable of doing anything other than observe the chilling sight before me. The creature's skull held an unusual feature. It held two red glowing lights. They burned in the empty eye sockets. These luminescent orbs created an eerie and unnatural spectacle as they cut through the dim forest light. They seemed to pulse with an uncanny life of their own. This was a sight as captivating as it was terrifying. It held me in its thrall. The light seemed to hum with an otherworldly energy. The next few moments stretched out, each second feeling like a tiny eternity as I remained rooted in place. Time seemed to lose its meaning, warping and twisting around me as I stood transfixed by the creature. Fear held me and kept my gaze locked on the creature. It was a silent fear, the kind that resonates deep in your bones and paralyzes your thoughts reducing the world to just you and the object in front of you. Overwhelmed by the sight of this monstrous creature and the smell of decay, I couldn't think. I was left standing there, my mind racing to understand what I had seen. Part of me, the biologist part, was fascinated and wanted to observe and understand. But another part of me, the instinctive part that values survival, was shouting for me to get away. I was torn between professional curiosity and the basic instinct to escape with my life. I considered capturing the creature on camera, but my hands wouldn't cooperate. Deciding it was best to remain still, and I watched as the creature eventually moved away. Seeing my chance, I quietly retreated, keeping my gaze on the spot where the creature had vanished until I was safely away. What followed was a blur. I reported the incident to my superiors who dismissed it as a misidentified animal protecting its kill. The smell of decay lingered for days, and those glowing eyes haunted my nightmares. In the days that followed, I wrestled with the experience. The memory of the creature was burned into my mind, reappearing in my dreams and turning them into nightmares. The smell of decay, now linked with the creature, seemed to follow me. I could literally smell it everywhere, at work, my colleagues were skeptical dismissing my story. Some even suggested it might have been a prank. Their doubt was disheartening. Despite this, I continued my work. But now with a heightened sense of awareness. I couldn't ignore what I had seen. The encounter made me question a lot, but also changed me. I've come to accept that there are things that cannot be explained with science, and that's alright. 
It's part of what makes the wilderness so intriguing. Let me know your thoughts, Donovan. Thanks for your time. The year was 1998, and I had been lucky enough to be a part of a hiking expedition that occurred out in the Rockies. I was thrilled to have been invited because I wasn't as seasoned as the rest of the group. I was nervous about keeping up with their expertise, and don't you know, in a very swift moment I became turned around and separated from the other hikers. This is a hiker's worst nightmare, especially when you are less experienced. I found myself turned around on a section of the trail that did not match up with what I knew about the Rocky Mountains. The ground turned coarse and full of rubble. Plants seemed practically non-existent, and a thick mist was rising, cutting me off from getting my bearings. Worse yet, I couldn't hear the group at all. Several times I tried screaming at the top of my lungs just to see if I could get anybody to answer me. There was nothing, nothing but the faintest sound around me. In fact, sometimes it seemed like nature itself was silent, shushing me as to stay silent with it. The first sign that things were not right was the article of clothing I found. I came across a pink denim cap of one of the people that had been hiking in my group. I didn't remember the girl's name, but I distinctly remember that faded pink cap for some reason. I am one of those people that can remember far more details than I can a person's name, but that's just how it is. I picked that up with the intention of eventually returning it to her. I even dared to take the sight of the hat as a sign of hope. Perhaps I was near them after all. But how could she have dropped the hat and not realized? Things didn't really make sense at this point. The hope was short-lived when I came across and recognized a backpack that had also belonged to someone in my group, but I couldn't place exactly who. I just knew I had seen it on someone. I continued through the thickening fog for hours with the distinct feeling that I was just going in circles. I thought about how my rations and supplies were very limited. If this continued, I would eventually have no choice but to perish out here all alone. Yes, I was already thinking about doom at this point. I came across another possession, one of my fellow hikers. This time there was a new level of bad news. It was a bandana that I remember seeing on one of the guys. The guy with spiked hair. It was stained with something dark and red, and I knew exactly what it was. I just didn't want to admit it. I couldn't fathom my brain going there. It was at that point that I began to feel panic, stalking me from a distance. My first thought was that robbers had came upon my group. Or maybe robbers isn't the correct word to use. Maybe modern day bandits. I don't know. But either way, something had clearly happened to the group. I hadn't heard any noises that would suggest a big bear or big cat attack. No screaming, no crying, nothing. I even looked in the dirt trying to find tracks or any sign of activity. There didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle. It's as if their clothing had just fallen off. So I quickened my pace with my visibility reducing by the minute and the things I could see were things that I didn't want to. I came across a pair of shattered glasses that were all too similar to the pair worn by the Asian girl in my group. Then there was a torn sports bra that also looked to be bloodstained. One article after another that I could recognize as being from my group emerged out of the fog as I pressed onward and my own sanity was beginning to teeter. So I broke into a light jog even though the ground and the visibility was treacherous. The path began to descend with the unusual rocky ground rising on either side of me. Then, just like that, the trail went into a small cave. Small enough that if I wanted to get inside, I would have had to stoop down. Something inside my body wanted me to turn and run, but my conscious and need to find the group overrode my primal caution. I wondered if they could be inside, so I struck up my lighter and reached into the cave. What came next? I remember only in particles because in my mind, evidently, was closer to breaking than I'd realized at the time. The halo of the flame showed nothing but rock at first, but then a pair of eyes turned to me from somewhere, at the edge of the light's influence, and then another pair, and then more. Then the light showed me towering furry bodies that were hunched in their stature, as if they were all used to a life of crouching and hiding. I hate to tell you this part, 
because it's going to sound like I'm crazy, but I can only tell you exactly what they resembled. And what they resembled were werewolves. That's the worst word to use with the complete overexposure of it. But honestly, there's no other word to describe what animal I saw. Their teeth extended well past their lips, and I can tell you they had long ears that looked like horns almost. Their mouths were busy chewing and gnashing something. I could hear the sounds of ripping and tearing. It was meat. They were eating on something. I didn't see. I immediately worked my way out, and they didn't give chase. I'll never know why. Maybe there's a reason they didn't want me. I'll never know. After climbing my way out, I luckily eventually found a trail, even though I was completely and utterly traumatized. I ended up contacting authorities, and they did a very thorough investigation. They also made a search of the area, but uncovered nothing, which was both surprising and unsurprising at the same time. I told them all about the bloody clothes and all the belongings I had found, and told them that I think that we were attacked by large, unknown predators. They didn't really seem to take my story seriously. In fact, I was even a suspect for a while in the disappearances. But nothing they found was conclusive. I even told them there was a cave where I had seen horrible beasts. I understand this story is sounding more and more crazy as I go on, but this is my experience that I have to live with. It will be with me forever, for the rest of my life. I don't get to just shut it off. And add to that, I have the trauma of dealing with being a potential suspect. Of course that didn't result in anything, because like I said, they couldn't find anything conclusive that led to me. Anyway, this was over 20 years ago, and none of them have ever been found. And I still live with the agonizing pain of it all. I've only told a handful of people over the years in hopes that somebody can give me reassurance that things will be okay and that I'll be able to get through everything. But who knows? I can only hope. I'm going to tell you this, Donovan, because I think you're the only one who'll believe me. Well, except one person, but I'll get to that later. I'm a student worker at the Ohio State University Main Library, officially known as the William Oxley Thompson Memorial Library. This thing is huge. 11 floors, which are mostly stacks, meaning rows and rows of bookshelves. You can stand on the bottom floor and look up at all those books. And let me tell you, doing that is not good if you have vertigo. I've been working there for a few months before I noticed anything unusual. I mostly reshelved the return books, so I spent a lot of time walking around in the stacks, pushing a book cart. One day, though, the student who normally helped the librarians close up was sick or something, so I had to stay late. It closes at midnight, and by then, hardly anyone's around other than a few really dedicated graduate students. There's a ton of lights in the library, because, like I said, it's huge. So they start turning them off before closing time, and then the workers walk around to make sure no one's still inside before locking the doors. It's a little creepy, to be honest, because during the day, light comes from the big windows and the skylights. But at night, it's a lot darker. As I was walking around, I saw a light at the end of a row of bookshelves. It was bright, but flickering, like a candle. I'll admit, I was scared. I didn't want to confront some weirdo who was lighting candles in the library. When I got closer, though, it flickered again and went out. I reached the spot where I thought it was coming from, and I saw nothing. I figured it was just some weird thing, or maybe I was imagining it. But then, that student, the one who was normally supposed to close, she quit. Just up and left OSU. So naturally, I was put on that shift. Now I had to close every shift I worked, which was three days a week. I'd pretty much forgotten about the light, but as soon as I walked up to that same place on the fifth floor and saw it again, I remembered. It disappeared again when I got close. I don't know what was going on, but after that, other weird stuff started happening with the lights. They would follow me going on as I walked and then off as I passed. One far away would flicker and then go out. Finally, I asked one of the librarians why the other student quit. She said she was scared of something, but wouldn't talk about it anymore. I wanted to keep my job, so I didn't push it. I looked up some stuff on ghosts trying to find out. If it was a ghost, how I could make it go away. 
but all of them said you had to know something about the person, the dead person, before you could really do anything. I started sneaking off to spend part of my shift looking at old copies of the campus newspaper. I'd grab a volume and flip through a few pages whenever I got the chance. It was slow work since I had no idea what I was looking for. But one day, as I flipped through one of the yellowing bound volumes, I felt something like a flash of lightning in my head. The story in front of me was about a girl who was caught burning candles in the library. This was in the 1970s, before the renovation of the library in 1977, that I'd seen mention of in other issues of the paper. The article noted that she'd been found dead outside the library, and people were speculating that she'd been conducting satanic rituals with the candles. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. I turned forward through the next few issues, but there weren't any other stories, which told me they never found out how she died. At least, that was my guess. So, I had some information, but I still didn't know how to get rid of her ghost. If it was her and if I could do it. Both big ifs. I did some more research and people always said ghosts need closure. But there was no way I could figure out who killed her. If someone did, way back in 1970. There was one idea that might work though, I thought, and that was making an altar. Well, not really an altar. More like one of those roadside memorials, you know. The kind with pictures and flowers and stuff. So I photocopied the picture of her from the paper and got some fake flowers. There are always bookshelves in big libraries like that that aren't full. I found one in the most remote part of the library, the very back in a corner, and put a little memorial there. I even found a little angel statue and stuck it with the other stuff. I don't know if ghosts can sense stuff like that. So I made sure that night when we were shutting down to walk to the memorial. And yeah, the lights were turning on in front of me and off behind me. This time, now that I knew, or at least thought I knew, what it was, it seemed less creepy. Almost just like someone walking there, except I couldn't see them. When I got to the memorial, the lights flickered. I walked away without looking back and the lights stopped following me. After I was pretty far away, I turned and looked back. I saw that bright, candle-like light seeming to hover near that shelf where the memorial was. The next night, I walked around and didn't see any weird stuff with the lights at all. It was strange, almost sad, like I almost missed it. When I went to where the memorial was, it was gone. Maybe the janitor picked it up or maybe something else happened to it, I don't know. But I never saw that flickering light again. Hi Donovan, I wanted to add my own story into the mix. In the last few years it's becoming more acceptable to talk about UFOs and the possibility of life on other planets, and I thought my story would be a perfect fit. It actually starts at Christmas, although the event itself took place in August. My husband and I love getting out in nature and my parents are aware of that. He's not great at giving gifts, but last Christmas he hit the nail on the head. He bought us two tickets to a remote astronomy show up in New Hampshire. We share a house in New Hampshire with my husband's family, so this couldn't have been more perfect. After doing the math, we figured out that the show itself was about a 45 minute drive from the house, so we decided to make it a long weekend. Thursday and Friday we just hung out, hit up some of our favorite local spots, and then Saturday night we got ready for the event. I'd never been to something like this before, but the directions were pretty clear. We were supposed to drive north to an area where they said the GPS would eventually cut out. There were directions on the packet we got with our tickets telling us how to get to a field. Once at the field, we'd park and set up to watch the show. They recommended bringing something to sit on, dinner, and drinks. Since it was August and the show was taking place at night, it was supposed to be pretty nice weather and clear skies. Once the GPS cut off, I read the directions to my husband, and we found ourselves on some pretty serious back roads. All dirt or gravel, really narrow, lots of potholes. It was rough going, and for some sections, we weren't hitting more than 10 miles per hour. This was truly out in the middle of nowhere. Eventually, we turned off of the road and onto a field and followed a line of cars. After parking, we followed everyone up a big hill where a guy with a megaphone was directing the crowd to find seating. 
It was still light out and he had live music. There must have been at least 150 other people there. We found a spot, set up beach chairs, and had a beer and some takeout we'd grabbed on the way there. The actual show itself was presented by a guy named Mark. He was a trained astronomer as well as a hobbyist and had apparently been doing this for the last three decades. Mark was making the rounds and we overheard him telling one group that it would be an exciting night as we should be able to see one of the space stations. My husband and I were pretty excited at this point and couldn't wait for dark. Eventually, it was dark enough and headlights had been off long enough that Mark decided to get started. He used a microphone to introduce himself, explain what he'd be going over tonight, and show us how his laser pointer worked. He started off with a few of the more well-known stars in a planet that was super visible. My husband and I were excited and tucked right in. Since we were in the middle of nowhere, it was literally pitch black except for the laser pointer. Honestly, kind of scary. Even on top of a hill, the nearest lights we could see were just before the horizon. Mark was really engaging and kept pointing out shooting stars, which he explained scientifically. Eventually, part of the crowd near the back started murmuring and making a bit of noise. This had happened a few times with people who had questions for Mark. Eventually, they would just call them out. But the noise came and went. People would murmur, shift around, and then it would quiet down. A few seconds later, it had started again, a little bit louder. Mark asked everyone to please keep it down, and someone shouted out that they had seen the space station. We were about 15 feet away from Mark and could see that he was visibly confused, especially when the person, a woman who ended up standing up, pointed in the direction that she and others had seen the station. Mark insisted that the space station would not be coming from that direction so she must have seen a shooting star. Especially there wasn't anything visible in the sky at the moment. But as he was speaking, we were all turned in that direction looking and we saw it. Or rather, I should say, them. Three very bright lights that were definitely too big to be stars or planets hovered low in the sky. They were all identical too. A bright bluish white and slightly elongated. I thought they all seemed to be strung together in a straight line. Mark went dead quiet and the people at the back of the crowd started talking excitedly again. My husband and I actually turned our chair around to get a better look. At this point, a lot of people were taking their phones out and snapping photos. Mark and his assistant were talking when suddenly one of the lights shot straight up and disappeared completely. That left two lights both sitting in the exact same spot, unmoving. Everyone was speechless for a second and then erupted in loud conversation and some shouts. Mark tried to calm everyone down, but he was also looking on his phone, probably to see if there were any reported objects in this area of the sky. As we watched, a second light shot off toward the west. It moved slowly at first and then faster until it too disappeared without a trace. I'm not talking that it moved so far away that it went out of sight. It just suddenly wasn't there. So then only the last light remained. It was hovering for almost two minutes before it dipped down a little lower in the sky. It moved slowly east and it was clear enough for us all to watch it. My husband was taking a video on his phone. Then, like the other two lights, this one shot off and disappeared as well. We were all left talking about what it could have been. Mark, who was obviously out of sorts, tried to get everyone to calm down but the rest of his show had a very restless feeling. Once the show was over, the drive back was actually a little eerie as my husband and I discussed what we might have seen. There were no lights at all in this part of New Hampshire, only our headlights and we were keeping a close eye out for deer, but I couldn't help looking up at the sky occasionally too. We got back to the house a little after midnight and stayed talking about the lights. The only explanation we could come up with since Mark had insisted he didn't know what they were was UFOs. There were enough people at the show that for a few days various videos and photos were circling around on social media. My husband and I showed our friends since we were pretty excited about what we'd seen. I was a little bummed to miss out on the space station, but we probably saw something that not many people see in their lifetimes, so it was an easy trade-off. Now we're thinking of going back for a show next year too. In the end, it was definitely the best Christmas present ever.
Hey Donovan, Jim here. Just your everyday fish catching guy from good old Milford, Connecticut. Fishing's been my bread and butter as long as I can remember. But man, something happened recently that's been messing with my head. I gotta tell you about it. Here we have this old rundown pier on the outskirts of town. The one that's always teeming with fish. It's actually a fishing mecca. Well, I was there a few evenings ago. Just me, my fishing gear, and my trusty thermos of coffee, all set for a quiet evening. But boy, was I in for a surprise. That peaceful pier that I've been to a million times turned out to be the set for a real-life horror show. Before the freaky encounter, I noticed a few off things. The sea was unusually calm, and the usual seagull chatter and other sea noises were missing. There was also this awful smell, like rotting seaweed but much stronger. Now, when I think about it, all these things were like warning signs of the bizarre spectacle that was about to take place. Now get ready for the wild part. As I'm sitting there relaxing, I start to notice something. There, emerging from the depths of the water, an enormous beast standing about eight feet tall rises. This creature, it's right there on the pier, completely out of the water, standing upright like some kind of twisted mockery of a man. Can you imagine the sight of that? It's like something straight out of a creature feature. A true horror show in flesh and bone. But its face, it's not something you would forget. Picture an alligator. You've seen them at the zoo or on TV, right? All scaly skin, elongated snout filled with sharp, jagged teeth. Now imagine that on a creature standing tall on two legs. It's surreal and incredibly frightening. Something you'd think was possible only in nightmares or fantasy tales. And its eyes. Oh boy, those eyes. They were this disturbing shade of yellow, like aged stained parchment or the eerie glow of a jack-o'-lantern on Halloween night. And the way they glowed, it was as if there was some wicked evil intelligence lurking behind them. You could almost feel them boring into you, like the creature was studying you, sizing you up. It sent shivers down my spine. The creature's movements were just as odd. It was like watching a toddler take its first steps or an old man with knees that have seen better days. Each step seemed labored painstaking, as if the creature was at odds with gravity itself. It was a strange, awkward dance between the creature and the firm ground beneath it, a dance that was as fascinating as it was terrifying. I know it's hard to picture, but think of the scariest scene from a horror movie you've seen. Imagine that scene unfolding right in front of you, in your real world, not on some distant, safe movie screen. The terror, the creeping dread, it's so real you could practically taste it. Terrifying doesn't even begin to describe it. It's a whole new level of fear. Yet, the most bizarre part? I couldn't tear my eyes away from it. Like a moth drawn to a flame despite every instinct screaming at me to run and to hide. My gaze was locked onto the creature. There was an eerie silence, an unsettling calmness that fell over the scene. The only sounds piercing the silence were the creature's heavy breaths. Each exhale, a low growl that echoed in the still night air and its awkward shuffling against the rough wood of the pier. The creaking of the timbers under its weight was like the desperate groan of the pier itself, echoing my own silent cries of fear. The moonlight cast an unearthly glow on the creature, highlighting the grotesque scales that covered its body. They glistened, almost metallic, like tiny shields offering protection to this beast from the depths. Its long arms ended in claws that scraped against the pier, a grating sound that sent chills up my spine. As it moved closer, I could see the steam rising from its body, a strange fog that swirled around it. Perhaps it was the cold seawater evaporating from its heated body, or maybe it was another of its bizarre alien qualities. It added an additional layer of horror to the scene, as if it was a phantom emerging from some ethereal plane. It was like I was hypnotized by the terrible spectacle before me, held captive by my own fear and fascination. As the creature continued its laborious, painful walk on the pier, I felt a shudder run through me. 
Eventually, my mind clicked in and I was out of there as soon as I could move, questioning whether I'd lost my mind. Even now, the image of that creature and its menacing yellow eyes haunts me. It's made the thought of going back to the sea really tough. Sure, the encounter was brief, but it's effects, man. They've stuck around. It's gotten to the point where I'm too scared to return to my favorite fishing spot. I was shaking as I started my truck and drove away from the pier that day, my heart pounding in my chest. That monstrous figure still lurks in my mind, making my days gloomy and my dreams nightmarish. Even the sea, which used to feel like home, now seems like a place of terror. Every unexpected wave or sound has me on edge. I can't shake this feeling of dread, this constant reminder of the horror hidden beneath the sea's calm surface. Anyway, that's what's been going on with me, Donovan. A few years ago now, I was driving home through a really thick wooded backcountry road. I was heading to the old farmhouse that my parents had lived in forever. It was fall, but not too late in the evening. The sun was still in the sky, although getting close to setting. If I think about it, I remember it was around September or October. I want to say the sun set somewhere between 7 and 8 that night. I can't be exactly sure, but it was probably sometime around there. I had the radio cranked so I couldn't hear much, but it wasn't like I was on the highway. Chances were I wouldn't encounter another vehicle until I pulled up to the house. That's just how remote and isolated my parents were, and they preferred it that way. They enjoyed the absolute solitude and silence of not having any neighbors nearby. In this day and age, I can't really blame them. I did, however, have my wits about me and my eyes on the road. No distractions for me. That is because, firstly, I'm not a moron, and also a buddy of mine had wiped out and hit a buck a few months back. He completely totaled his car. I think he was doing 60 or 70, and of course I think it was a 4-6 pointer that walked out in front of his car. And he wasn't driving anything too impressive. I think it was a Toyota Camry. So you can imagine the carnage that happened. Luckily, by the blessing of whatever higher power you believe in, he managed to only have a couple fractures here and there. Nothing too big, but I really didn't want to be dealing with that. Mostly for me, I especially didn't want the fallout of not having a vehicle to work with. So while singing along to the radio, but paying attention to the road, I was able to throw my foot down hard on the brake as soon as I saw what I thought was a large deer. It had run out in front of me. My Aunt Susie used to be obsessed with a TV show called The X-Files. I've watched a few reruns with her and it's been on cable TV. If you're the right age, I'm sure you've heard of it. But if you haven't, well, just Google it. This thing that stood in front of my car, my first thought was, thanks to Mulder, that it was a werewolf. Thankfully, I had the good sense to remember that they only come out at night and on a full moon. I'll have you know, I did my lore research. I was able to take a closer look at this mysterious creature. It stood still, as if it was caught in a moment of indecision, unsure whether it should run or stay. This gave me ample time to check it out. This creature was gigantic, and its body was covered entirely in hair or fur, which made me think it resembled something like a Bigfoot. Could it have been a Bigfoot, you ask? Maybe, but it had a unique feature. Its head was that of a dog. The creature's face also wasn't what you'd expect from a traditional Bigfoot. Instead, it had characteristics that were more wolf-like, as if it was a human with certain wolfish traits. But it wasn't a typical human face. It had parts that looked distinctly wolfish, like it had a snout. Also, it had ears that were definitely wolf-like. These ears were tall, pointed, and even had tufts of hair at their tips, like those of a wolf. What was it exactly? Honestly, I don't know. If I had to compare it, to anything, I'd say it most closely resembled a human-sized German Shepherd. You see, we have a German Shepherd at my parents' farm, so try to visualize this. Imagine a German Shepherd's face, painted it all in black, and the top portion of its face, the part where there's no snout looking somewhat human. That's what I saw in this creature. Whatever this thing was, 
I was sure and certain that this didn't normally exist, whatever it was, but fortunately, it didn't seem to want to hurt me. I kind of got the impression by the whole encounter that this thing was caught off guard by my car, almost running into it, and it seemed like it had to make a quick decision to bolt across the road to get out of there. I took a deep breath trying to calm my racing heart and tried to comprehend what I was seeing. Was it a hallucination? Or some kind of strange animal yet to be discovered by science? I didn't know, but one thing was certain I didn't want to stick around to find out. With one last glance at the creature, I pushed the pedal to the metal and the car lurched forward, tires screeching against the asphalt. As I glanced in my rearview mirror, I could see the creature still standing there, watching me drive away. Its yellow eyes were almost glowing in the dark, reflecting the last bit of light from my taillights. Even after I got home, the image of the creature lingered in my mind. Sleep didn't come easily that night, and when it did, my dreams were filled with images of that creature. I knew I had to find out what it was, or at least try. I decided to research cryptids and unexplained creatures to see if I could find any information about what I had seen. But no matter how much I searched, I couldn't find any creature that resembled what I saw that night. Even to this day, the memory of that night still haunts me. It's become a story I tell around the campfire, a tale of a mysterious creature in the night. What it was, I might never know, but one thing's for sure, it was an experience I'll never forget. This happened in Northwest Utah. I was sent out by dispatch to investigate an incident with a wild animal at an old farmhouse. Not really my area, but we didn't have a local animal control in the county, so the job fell to me. The call came in the night before, but since it wasn't technically an emergency and no one was in danger, the station waited until the morning to send someone out. I reached the farmhouse at about 8.15 a.m. The woman who lived there was elderly, I'd say, in her 70s if I had to guess. I don't recall her exact age. She lived alone in the house and the farm was no longer in use. The woman kept a few goats as pets, but that was about it. There were three buildings on the property besides the house. A large barn that sat directly opposite the house, a smaller barn next to it, and a small storage area that was situated perpendicular to the smaller barn. The goats were kept in the smaller barn. The other buildings were used for storage. The story she told me when I arrived was absolutely bizarre. She said the incident happened at around 9 or 10 p.m. the night before, but she had been having problems before that for quite a while. She claimed her goats had been disappearing out of the pen at night. She couldn't figure it out. She had installed chicken wire on the inside of the fence to prevent any animals from getting under the boards but the goats kept disappearing. It wouldn't be often. Maybe a couple of goats would go missing every month. There was no pattern to it and no signs of animals breaking in through the fence. She figured someone must have been stealing them, so she started putting them all inside the barn at night and locking the doors with chains and a padlock. When she began keeping the goats inside, they stopped disappearing, but other, stranger things began happening. She would hear knocking on the walls of her house and on the roof. Like someone was trying to beat the walls down, but whenever she would go to investigate, the noises stopped. She said sometimes she would hear a screeching or screaming sound coming from outside, but never found its source. Last night, she heard the screeching sound again and went out onto the porch to investigate. She looked around, but didn't see anything at first, but then a pair of eyes caught her attention. The woman said there was a giant bird-looking creature sitting atop the roof of the larger barn. She claimed it had to be about five to six feet tall and had a crest on its head and a very long, narrow beak. She said she knew that was the creature responsible for killing her goats. Its eyes reflected back at her and then it took flight. She said its wings were more like a bat than a bird. It had feathers, but it looked to have claws like a bat does. She said the creature flew straight towards her and she ran back inside the house and locked the door. She said she had never seen a bird like that in all her years of living out there. The creature rammed its body to the closed door. 
The woman said she was terribly frightened, but she wanted to know what it was. So she looked through the window next to the door. She said it looked reptilian, like a sort of flying lizard. It had feathers, but the eyes of a snake. I wasn't really sure what to do about this situation. This woman just described a dinosaur to me. I figured it was just a very large predatory bird, and maybe the woman's eyes weren't what they used to be. I recorded her story just as she told it. I did add a note that I thought it was likely a large vulture. She showed me the scratches on the door in the outside of the house and there was substantial damage. I didn't have a good explanation for her, nor did I have a solution. She showed me the barn where the creature tried to break in. I asked if she had a gun because she is allowed to shoot any animal on her property that is threatening her livestock, whatever type of animal it turns out to be. I told her it might be a good idea to set up cameras to try to figure out what type of bird it was and go from there. What she really wanted was for someone to just get rid of the creature for her, but there wasn't much I could do about that. I did investigate the area around the goat pasture in the barn. If I hadn't gone out there, I would have written this incident off on the ramblings of a crazy old lady. I found a feather. Just one. It was huge, like it belonged to an eagle or possibly something larger. The feather itself was red with bits of yellow splattered in towards the stem. I bagged it for evidence. I told the woman I would send it out for testing and see what species it is. And that was that, or so I thought. I sent the feather out to be tested. It's not typically something we would do, but I was curious. It had been a month and I hadn't heard anything about the feather. I asked my superior and he told me the test came back as inconclusive. I did a bit of digging and called the lab myself. Now here is where it gets weird. When I asked about the results of the feather and gave them the case number, they told me it was classified and I didn't have clearance to get the results. The old woman called me at the station a few days later. She said a team of detectives had been out to her farm to follow up on the case, but they wouldn't give her any information. I didn't have anything else to tell her other than I believed her and to get something to protect herself and her goats if she planned on staying out there. I can't tell you what the creature was, but I do know there was a significant effort to cover it up. About two months ago, my roommate and I moved into an apartment in an old mill town. With the housing market so crazy, we ended up deciding not to buy a house like we'd planned. Apartment prices have also been really high, but we got lucky and this building had someone break their lease unexpectedly. The apartments are in an old paper mill and ours is on the second floor facing a pond. The pond we can see is called Paper Goods. It's not huge, but it has a nice little public frontage area where people can park, eat lunch and walk their dogs. It gets a lot of foot traffic. We have a smaller dog who is older now, and it's convenient that the park is there because he has to go out like every two hours. I've been working from home ever since the pandemic, which works out perfectly. My roommate Jason is a nurse at the local hospital and usually works the third shift. He gets home around 7 a.m. every morning. My job starts around 8, so I wake up early and have a few hours to eat clean up and take the dog out before Jason gets home to sleep. A week after moving into the apartment, I took our dog Sam outside really early. He wakes me up when he needs to go out and I get up really quickly so that he doesn't have an accident. I went out in sweatpants and a jacket since it was starting to get cold here. Dawn was just coming up and it wasn't quite light out. The street lights were still on and the ponds covered in mist. It was really pretty and I snapped a picture to send Jason while Sam was sniffing around. I crossed the street to go over into the little park and kept an eye out for the geese, who usually hang out looking for bread and scraps. A little past the picnic tables, there's an area with stairs that leads down to the water. You can't actually get to the water because of the reeds, and it's always shady there. I was waiting for Sam to finish checking out a rock when I looked up and saw a person standing near the reeds. But after a few seconds, I realized it wasn't a person, just a person-shaped figure in the mist. I moved a little closer and noticed that where the feet should have been, there was nothing. The figure was floating about a foot off the gravel. Sam didn't seem concerned at all and kept wandering down the path, 
which circled much closer to the figure. I went along but kept my keys in between my fingers just in case. We got about 15 feet away and the figure shifted a little in the opposite direction. It was like a denser gathering of fog in a vaguely human shape. Again, Sam didn't react to it at all and just kept going. As we headed back toward the apartment building, I kept turning to look back, but it didn't move from that spot. By the time we got back inside, when I looked out the window, the fog was mostly gone over the pond, and the figure was as well. I didn't tell Jason about it because I knew it sounded crazy. I didn't see it the next day anyway. There wasn't any fog, but two days later it was there again in almost the same spot. This time I crept a little bit closer and again the figure moved away from me, only a few feet, but it was definitely reacting to me moving closer. Jason had the next day off, so I decided not to say anything again, knowing he'd be the one to bring Sam out first thing. He commented that I was up really early. I usually sleep in when he's off, and I just waved it off. But I watched at the window when he took Sam over to the pond. I had to squint, but even from our apartment, I could see the shape in the fog, in almost the same spot, near the reeds. I also saw the exact moment he saw it. Jason stopped for a second, but Sam kept trying to trot ahead and got snagged. After a few seconds, Jason actually turned around and headed back to the apartment. I was waiting at the door when he got there and asked if he'd seen it. He immediately asked me what it was, not even bothering to ask how I knew about it. I told him I had no idea, and we stood in the kitchen talking about it. Like I said, it was early enough in the day that we never saw anyone else over there, so we didn't know if anyone else had seen it. I explained I'd seen it a few days ago, but wanted to see if he noticed it too, so I'd know I wasn't crazy. We both agreed that whatever it was, whether it was a natural phenomenon or some kind of ghost, didn't seem malevolent in any way. It just kind of hung out there. We kept seeing it over the next few days. When Jason got home in the morning, he'd ask if I'd seen it and I'd update him. On days he was off, we woke up together and took Sam out to get another look at it. We never saw any features, heard any voices or anything like that. But every now and then we'd see what looked like an arm or a leg and the figure would look a little more like a person. These last few days we haven't seen the figure at all since there hasn't been any fog or mist. Part of me thinks maybe it's hanging around in the same spot anyway, but I'm too scared to walk over and try to feel it out. We're going to continue keeping an eye out for it, and hopefully it keeps showing up, whatever it is. I worked as a volunteer for search and rescue in my area. I lived near a popular hiking area on the east side of the Rocky Mountains so we would often get out-of-state hikers who were woefully unprepared for mountain weather and terrain. Normally, we would be able to find the person and get them home safe, but we have some pretty dangerous wildlife out here, and while they don't often go after humans, they'll make quick work of a body if something were to happen to you out there. If you fell down a rocky hill and broke your leg, a bear might see you as an easy meal, and in a couple of days, there'd be nothing left. No trace whatsoever. If someone goes missing out here and we can't find them, it's probably because the wildlife found them first. Or at least that what I've always been told. I'm not sure what to believe anymore. My revelation comes from a season where we had three hikers all go missing, without a trace around the same area. They were individual cases, no connection between them, and they happened several weeks apart. I was part of the horseback search team. They liked to have us on horseback because we could cover more ground and traverse rough terrain a lot easier than we could on foot. A lot of us riders in the area end up doing this on a volunteer basis just as something to do, but that's not really important to the story. I got really familiar with the area after doing three extensive searches that season. All of the missing hikers were reported as likely wildlife fatalities. There was a large cave system nearby and the police were convinced we were dealing with a predatory bear that lived in the area, though they were unable to find it. I wasn't convinced. I was pretty good friends with one of the lead officers from Fish and Wildlife. He told me that bears don't typically live in caves. In fact, no large predators do. Sometimes they'll take up temporary residence in a cave, 
But even when searching for hibernation spots, bears tend to burrow in a side hill. He didn't think we were dealing with a bear. Something might live in those caves, he said, but it isn't a bear. We organized the team to do one last search around the caves before officially calling it off. I remember it well. There was no sign of the missing hiker, or any of the missing hikers for that matter, but we did the search anyway. We organized in grids so we wouldn't be overlapping. My section of the grid was the one nearest to the caves, but I wasn't concerned. I was on horseback and I was carrying a sidearm in the event I ran into any combative wildlife. My horse never much liked that area, but we had been over there so many times that year, I thought she was finally getting used to it. She was on edge that night. She wasn't outwardly nervous, but I could tell she thought something there wasn't right. In hindsight, I should have listened to her. It was around dusk when we were on our way out that I heard something in one of the caves as we passed by. It sounded like someone threw a rock down the cave, but I didn't see anything. I asked, who's there, but received no response. A moment later, in the darkness of the cave, I saw two eyes emerge. My first thought was bear, or mountain lion, so I grabbed my gun and pointed it at the mouth of the cave. I told whatever it was to stay in there, not expecting it could understand me, but oftentimes if wild animals hear humans, they'll steer clear. But if this really was the rogue predatory bear that was killing these hikers, I was likely in trouble. My horse was fidgety and nervous now, and I couldn't blame her. I could tell she wanted to bolt and run, but I didn't want the creature in the cave to chase us if it didn't already have a mind to. It blinked at us in the darkness and slowly emerged from its rocky home. What I saw at the mouth of the cave left me speechless. I expected to see some kind of animal. Something covered in fur, but this was far from that. It looked like a little human, almost ghoul-like. It was bald and pale as the moonlight shining above. Its limbs were spindly and appeared too long for its body. Its legs had strange angles to them, almost as if they were a morph of human legs and those of a dog. The creature moved awkwardly, but I imagine if it wanted to run, it could move pretty damn fast with those hind legs. Its face was the worst part. I mean, seriously, I can't even properly describe it to you. It was like looking at a skull. Imagine it, its nose was just two slits on its face. And those eyes, oh man, those dark eyes took up just about its entire head. The way it stared at me sent chills down my spine. It looked like some sort of demon, something out of a horror film. It hissed at me when it saw me, and I am not ashamed to admit I was scared out of my wits. Without thinking, I took a shot at it, but who knows if it hit. I mean the creature retreated into the cave so quickly I couldn't tell if the shot landed or not. There was no way I was sticking around to see if it was going to come back out. I was out of there like a bat out of hell. Once I got back to my truck, my hands were still shaking and I called up my friend from Fish and Wildlife. I told him straight up that I saw something in the cave a moment ago, and that it wasn't a bear. I expected him to laugh or make some joke, but he was pretty cryptic in his response. He told me about the unsolved missing person cases near large cave systems, and how there's all this speculation about what the correlation is, if there even is one. The way he talked about it was chilling, I tell you. He mentioned that the police didn't know about it, but most park rangers did. He even said that half the time they are sent out to dispatch a dangerous bear, it turns out to be something else entirely, something that isn't a bear at all. I could tell he was serious, and he told me to go home, assuring me that he'll take care of it. And that was that. It was like an unspoken agreement between us to never talk about it again. But I'll admit, it's something that's haunted me ever since. Every time I drive by that area, or hear about another missing person. I can't help but think about that creature and what it might really be. It's one of those things, you know? The more you think about it, the more it gets to you. It's left me with more questions than answers. What was that thing? Why did my friend from Fish and Wildlife seem to know about it? And why don't they tell the police? But I guess some things are just better left unknown. All I know is I'll never look at caves or wild animals the same way again. I still have dreams about those dark, soulless eyes staring at me from the shadows of that cave. It's an experience I wouldn't wish on anyone, and something I'll never forget. No way, no how.
A few months ago, we got a new security system for our house that included two mounted cameras. One was on the doorbell and another was a motion sensor camera that looked out over the backyard. We didn't live in a bad area or anything, but people stealing packages off of porches wasn't unheard of. And we ordered a lot of stuff from Amazon. We also had two dogs. And when the camera detected motion, we got a notification. Soon our dogs figured out they could activate the backyard sensor to let us know that they wanted back inside. We had a huge yard in a rural area, so we let them out to run around the yard whenever they wanted. This new system worked out well, at least until something started tripping our camera at all hours of the night. The little dinging notification would wake me or my husband up a few times a week, and it drove us crazy. At first, we just turned our phones off at night, once the dogs were inside. But we were definitely still curious about what was out there. We tried watching the video, but the quality wasn't great in the dark, and we never saw anything clearly. Sometimes we thought we saw a blur at the edge of the yard, but it could have been a shadow or anything really. So, we gave up and started to ignore the notifications. A month later, one of our dogs came home injured. He had some bloody scratches and bite mark punctures. He was whimpering like crazy, and we freaked out. We rushed him to the vet to get him all patched up. Luckily, he was going to be okay, but the vet gave him a bunch of shots just in case. When we asked what could have done it, the vet was stumped. He said the bite marks were vaguely canine, but too big to be a domestic dog. They didn't quite match anything he was familiar with. For a while after that, we were really careful about keeping the dogs close to the house. We always watched them when they were in the yard, and we didn't let them stay out long. We also noticed that our dog that had been attacked had no interest in getting too far from the house. We talked about different ideas, like fencing in a smaller area, but the dogs were energetic and loved being able to run. We decided to wait and see if anything else happened. It had been months without an incident, so we started cautiously letting them stay out longer and not watching them every second. We were hoping it had been a freak occurrence, and for a while, it seemed fine. But then one evening, a little before dusk, we heard them barking like crazy. We nervously ran outside and called to them. At first, they didn't come to us and they stayed at the edge of our property, barking and growling at something we couldn't see. We keep calling them and it took a while, but eventually, they did come. That night, I left my phone volume up. I don't know why, but I just wanted to know if something was out there after all, especially if it was whatever had previously attacked our dog. I couldn't sleep and kept alternating watching out the window and keeping an eye on the security system app. By 1 a.m., nothing had come past, so I relaxed and fell asleep. Luckily, when the ding sounded on my phone, I was only half asleep. I shot up and grabbed my phone. I looked at the video and saw that dark blur again. Something was out there. I was sure of it now. I woke my husband, and he grabbed a baseball bat because that was all we had and we both slowly went downstairs without turning on any lights. We looked out the back door window and watched for the black blur. We didn't turn on the light because we didn't want to scare anything away or alert it to us being there before we got a good look. It took about 10 minutes before we saw it move, but there it was, big and dark, walking way down at the far edge of the property. And when I say walking, I mean walking upright, like a person, not on all fours. It was so weird. We had been expecting an animal, but wondered if it was a person after all. Maybe someone lurking around, looking for stuff to steal. I'd been sure that the thing that had attacked our dog was the same thing in the backyard, but now I was confused. Did we have a dangerous wild animal on the loose and a creepy guy? What were the odds of having both? We kept watching, hoping to get a better look so we could tell the police something useful if we needed to. Eventually, it came closer to the house, just close enough for us to see it in the moonlight. We saw fur, fur everywhere. The person, or thing, was tall, really tall, but covered in fur. It didn't make any sense. It was coming closer to the house now. If it came any closer, I planned to turn on the back floodlight and see it. It took a few minutes, but it did come close enough. I reached over and flipped the light switch flooding the backyard with light. The thing screeched and turned and ran, but not before we saw it clearly. We saw the tall, dark, furry body, 
and also the face, the horrible face. It was dog-like, with a canine-looking snout and long, sharp teeth. The most terrifying aspect was the eyes, reddish-orange and glowing as they glared straight at us before running off. The thing had looked like a demonic dog, but also a person. We called the police and animal control, but once we explained how we had seen this strange creature walking around with glowing eyes, they seemed to discount our story. We even sort of thought we were crazy too. How could this thing really exist? We got a half-hearted promise from the police that they would search the woods and set some traps, but we could tell that it probably would never happen, and they never did come back to update us. Luckily, that thing hasn't come back either, at least not yet. Hey there, I'm Jake. At the time of this story, I was in my 20s and living in Central Florida. I always enjoyed exploring unknown places and searching for things that defied ordinary explanation. That led me to the Everglades in Florida, a place I had always wanted to visit because it is so steeped in mystery and folklore. The Everglades are famous for their sprawling wetlands, mysterious marshes, and dense mangrove forests. But among the locals, they're also known for something more sinister, a place where strange and unexplained occurrences have been reported for generations. I decided to head to there after hearing stories about an unidentified creature spotted in the area. Some people called it a mere alligator, but others swore that it was something more ominous, something otherworldly. Intrigued, I planned my trip during the fall, when the swamps are supposedly at their most eerie. When I first arrived, the feeling was instant. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stepped into another world. The air was thick with humidity, clinging to my skin. Tall, moss-covered trees loomed overhead, and the ever-present chorus of insects buzzed in my ears. I took my time getting to know the area. The wetlands stretched out before me, a maze of waterways and thick vegetation. I could see alligators lazily swimming in the murky waters, their eyes just above the surface, watching. Birds of every color took flight as I made my way deeper into the marshes, and the sound of unseen creatures rustled in the underbrush. I set up camp near a large clearing, where the trees gave way to a wide open view of the sky. The first night passed uneventfully, but I couldn't shake my strange feeling. It was as if the swamp was alive. During the day, I explored the dense mangrove forests, getting lost more than once. I stumbled upon hidden pockets of beauty. I even found evidence of the native wildlife, tracks of raccoons and signs of other creatures that called the Everglades home. But mixed with the natural beauty was something unsettling. I would catch fleeting glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, shadows that didn't quite align with the wind's movement, sounds that didn't quite fit with the normal sounds of the swamp. By the end of the first day, my sense of adventure had been tinged with a feeling of unease. The Everglades were hiding something, and I could feel it in my bones. It all began around midnight. The moon was hidden behind a thick layer of clouds, and I was navigating through the wetlands with my flashlight. The only sound was the occasional splash of water, or the distant hoot of an owl. I remember coming across a clearing, and that's when I saw it. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. The darkness of the night and the shadowy terrain could mess with your mind, after all but standing there just a few feet away was something enormous and unmistakably real. Its face was like that of an alligator, yet twisted and unnatural, as if sculpted by some dark force. Those yellow, piercing eyes seemed to glow in the dim light, locking onto mine with an intelligence that was both alien and terrifying. They were not just the eyes of a predator. They held something deeper, a malicious cunning that seemed to stare into my very soul. The creature's body was an odd fusion of reptilian features. It was covered in coarse, uneven scales that glistened in the pale moonlight. Its limbs were thick and muscular, yet they seemed out of proportion, giving its movements a strange and awkward gait. Despite standing upright, it retained a hunched posture, as if it were not quite used to this form. Its long tail trailed behind, thrashing slowly as if it had a mind of its own. Its evil eyes never left mine as it seemed to consider me, sizing me up, 
evaluating whether I was prey or something more. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I was trapped in those haunting, unblinking eyes, paralyzed by a mixture of fear and fascination. Its jaw opened slightly, revealing rows of sharp, predatory teeth. I could hear a low growl, a sound that resonated in my chest. The air around us seemed to grow colder. It shifted its weight, muscles rippling under the scales, and I could see the sheer power contained within its form. Despite its awkward appearance, there was no doubt that it could move with terrifying speed if it chose to. Every rational thought told me to run, to flee from this impossible being, but my feet were rooted to the spot. All I could do was stare back, locked in a silent duel. Part of me wanted to run, to flee from this entity that seemed to have stepped out of some nightmare. My instinct screamed at me to put as much distance between myself and the creature as possible. Yet another part of me was inexplicably captivated by its presence. It was a fascination that went beyond mere curiosity. It was a profound connection that I couldn't shake. Though it represented everything unknown and terrifying, there was something in its eyes that held me. I stood there, caught in a struggle between fear and fascination. The minutes felt like hours, each second stretching into eternity as we stared at each other, locked in a silent communion. I was drawn deeper into those haunting eyes, the rest of the world falling away until there was nothing but the creature and me. Then, almost as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature finally turned away. It began to move, lumbering into the darkness with its awkward, shambling gait. Its movements were slow at first, deliberate and measured, as if it were reluctant to break the connection. But gradually it picked up pace, its form growing fainter and fainter until it was swallowed by the swamp. As I finally began to move, the sounds of the swamp slowly returning to my ears, I realized that I had been given a glimpse into a world that few have ever seen. I returned to camp, but sleep was impossible. The following day, I went back and tried to find traces of the creature, but there was nothing. No footprints, no signs, no evidence. I left the Everglades with more questions than answers. The experience stayed with me, haunting me. People may dismiss my story, but I know what I saw. The Everglades hold secrets, and I had stumbled upon one of them. That creature, whatever it was, will always be etched in my memory, a chilling reminder to embrace the wonder and terror of our extraordinary world. I was headed toward my car on the last leg of my evening jog. I preferred jogging at the state park near my house instead of the road. I had seen one too many pedestrian accidents in my community to feel safe running on the roads in the evening hours. Although, after my experience in the park, I don't feel safe running there anymore either. I don't typically jog late at night, but my shift ran a little longer than usual. I will say that the park is a little more remote than is probably safe for night adventures. I haven't seen any weird people there after dark, but we do have quite a robust wildlife population in the area. Think, bears, cougars, wolves, moose. I was smart about it. I carried bear spray and made sure to play music on my phone when I was out after dark. Most animals in my experience will stay away from you if they hear you coming. I was maybe two miles from the car when I stopped to take a breather. I grabbed some water from my pack and decided to walk for a moment. The sun had set, but there was still some light left. I wasn't worried yet, but I knew I had to keep moving if I wanted to get out of there before dark. All of a sudden, an orange light shone behind me. It was like the sun came out for a moment. I knew there was nothing out there that could make a light that bright. It definitely wasn't someone's flashlight or even headlights from a vehicle. It was as bright as the sun. The whole forest ahead of me lit up in an orange glow. I turned around to see if I could find the source of the light, and it disappeared just as suddenly as it had arrived. However, standing behind me in the near darkness was a single deer. The moment I had turned around, I was hit with a stench of death and decomposition. It's so overpowering that I just about hit my knees. And like I said, it wasn't there a moment ago. I knew right away that it was coming from the deer. The creature was thin with ribs protruding through its skin. I was surprised its legs could support its weight. 
I figured it must be sick of have some type of gangrenous wound on it somewhere to be causing that type of stench. Despite its ill health, it had a rack of antlers spanning twice the width of its body. I almost felt bad for the creature, believing it was most likely sick and very, very old, but there was something else. I couldn't pinpoint the reason then, but I knew there was something else wrong. I tried to shoo the deer away, but it didn't budge. I still had a ways to go to get to my car, and I didn't want to turn my back on it. After failing to scare it away yet another time, I did decide to turn around and head toward my car. As soon as I turned my back, the orange light lit up the sky again. I spun around to face the deer. It was standing in the same place I had left it. I didn't know how, but I knew it had something to do with the light and the unmovable stench of death that filled the air. Its eyes were dark and soulless. What the hell are you? I asked it. And then the orange light returned, glowing bright like the sun behind the deer. The whole forest was now lit with this artificial daylight. The deer then looked at me and began to lift its head as I watched its antlers turn upside down, like they were melting. They looked soft and started dripping, literally melting into the forest floor. But that wasn't all. The creature's fur began to slough off, exposing rotting skin and muscle underneath, and in some places, exposed bone. The skin of its face peeled back and rolled down its neck, like someone put a torch to it. The creature's entire skull was exposed, and its eyes were missing. Its jaw cracked open and fell to the ground, leaving its tongue nowhere to go but to fall in front of its neck. To say I was horrified was an understatement. My hands were shaking so badly that I couldn't get my bear spray out of its holster. I didn't know if the spray would have any effect on this thing, but it was all I had. I took a few stumbling steps backwards, and then the orange light ceased. Darkness fell upon the forest, and the creature standing before me was a deer once again. I had asked it what it was and it showed me. It revealed its real and total self to me. I wondered what it wanted with me, but I didn't dare ask. I couldn't imagine it was anything good, so I turned and I ran. I don't think I've ever ran that fast before in my life. The creature didn't chase me, and I didn't experience the orange light shining again in the sky. Part of me thinks the creature was just screwing with me, because something that could do that could have probably made quick work of me if it wanted to. I don't know why it let me go, but I can tell you one thing for certain, and it's that I am staying the hell out of the forest after dark. I believe in hypnosis. This day and age you have to, don't you think? White line fever kind of made it a thing. It's irrefutable. You know what that is, right? It's that sensation you get after driving for a while arriving at your destination, only to wonder how exactly you got there. That's a form of hypnosis. Your mind drifts away while your body stays in place, going through the motions with every measure of practice safety. Your body shifts into autopilot. In those instances, you lose maybe 10 minutes of your time. Maybe you've got a long commute and it's 40 minutes or even an hour. There's a limit, you know? Your brain kind of checks in. It pings back into your body to make sure muscle memory hasn't steered you off a cliff or something. In cases like this, it's easy to forgive the 10 minutes of time that you don't remember experiencing. However, I've forgotten more than 10 minutes. I've forgotten three days. Maybe in the span of an entire life, three days doesn't sound like a lot, but it sure is for me. It was not a bender and it was not some accident. Three days were stolen from me. I remember driving east on I-90, crossing South Dakota. I was on the way home after spending the holiday in Montana. I was only midway through the drive. I wasn't tired yet, but I was alone on the road. My eyes were playing tricks on me, like eyes do. Every pair of headlights cresting over the horizon felt like a big deal. When they were far away and especially small, I found myself hoping that I was coming upon a city. I-90 isn't much to look at, and a city would have helped pass the time. But each time, it was always the light of some other vehicle coming towards me. We passed and then drifted apart in anonymity. That went on for about an hour. Then a trio of blinking lights crested on that horizon, all different colors, spaced too far apart to be the front end of a car. Blinking, flashing, 
fading to black. I remember turning down the radio and shifting the lever that cleans my windshield. There was something wrong about those lights. They weren't just coming toward me. They were rising off the ground. They were climbing too high to be a trick of the road. Three lights, yellow, blue, and red. They brightened and dimmed. They started to spin as if each was mounted on the edge of a giant frisbee. I remember under my breath and asking just what I'd found. I remember passing underneath the lights. I remember sticking my head out of the driver's side window to get a better look at the vessel above me. It was as long as two city buses stacked end to end. The strobe of the lights revealed a smooth black metal. There were no connected parts and no seams where the material was bound together. The shape was one solid piece. Another light came down, I think. I remember shielding my eyes from something. I remember slamming on the brakes. If it was another car on the road, there were never any reports. I remember feeling like I was falling. Then I woke up back home. I literally blinked and I was home. Not only home, but I was standing in my local grocery store with a gallon of milk in my hand. I dropped the carton and it ruptured. Milk sloshed over my shoes while I stood there in the aisle. But they weren't the shoes I was wearing in the car. It was daylight out. Not the next day, I soon learned, but three days later. But apparently, I'd arrived home on schedule, if my boss is to be believed. I showed up where I was supposed to when I was supposed to. I spoke to my friends and family. I told everyone all about Montana and described a peaceful drive home. I know it wasn't me speaking, not really. Otherwise, I would have mentioned the lights in the sky. I live my life as normal for those three days, or at least my body did. Autopilot. Auto living. There's no point in doubting whether or not my body was here. Everyone says that it was, so who am I to argue? But that didn't make it right. I saw a doctor about it since I thought I was going crazy. There were no abnormalities in my brain or in my sleeping patterns. Everything psychological was right as rain. I have a new scar though. I found it recently. It's a vertical line down the back of my neck, running parallel to my spine. I asked for an x-ray on it and I've had surgery, I guess. There's also now a metal plate connecting two of my vertebrae. I've seen the scans with my own eyes. I can feel it when I press my fingers against my neck, but it's not supposed to be there. There's no record of that operation. I know there was no auto accident. My car wasn't wrecked and I wasn't hospitalized. If the surgery was performed over those three days, I wouldn't have healed already. Yet what other explanation is there? I saw the lights. I saw the craft. And then I arrived home. I arrived home early. And I lived three days of my life without ever realizing it. I find myself wondering what woke me up. What provoked my brain to check back in on reality in that specific moment? It was just a trip to the grocery store as far as I could tell. Or were they simply done with me? Did they finish with the body first and then spend some extra time on the mind? Did they like what they found? Three days is a lot of time. It's a long time to spend without control. It's long enough that it's hard to imagine what my mind was doing while my bones were walking around these streets. Where was I? What was I doing? What was being done to me? I can't get the time back. I know that now. I just need someone to tell me if this is all over. I don't want to be afraid of the lights at the end of the road. All right, let me tell you about this crazy mission I went on in Ecuador. We were a small group of Army Special Forces soldiers sent on a top secret operation to gather intel on some mysterious facility. The place was surrounded by barbed wire fences and what caught our attention right away was the Russian flag waving proudly on one of the buildings. We had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. As we approached the facility, we couldn't help but notice something strange lurking inside. There was this massive creature like nothing any of us had ever seen before. Picture an eight-foot-tall dog but standing on its hind legs. It was muscular with the kind of build that reminded me of a werewolf from those old horror movies. Yeah, that's exactly what it looked like. Now, our orders were crystal clear. Take photos of whatever was going on in there, but under no circumstances were we to engage with the creature or anyone else. 
But let me tell you, curiosity got the better of us. We couldn't just ignore this strange beast and the whole operation happening right under our noses. We quietly moved closer, making sure not to alert anyone. It was nerve-wracking, to say the least. The adrenaline was pumping through our veins as we snapped photos of the facility and the creature. We had to document everything, even though we had no clue what it all meant. But then, the unexpected happened. One of my comrades accidentally stepped on a twig, snapping it like a firecracker. Instantly, all hell broke loose. The creature's head snapped towards us, its glowing eyes fixed on our group. It let out a bone-chilling growl that echoed through the night. We were frozen for a moment, but instinct kicked in, and we scrambled to retreat. The creature charged at us, its powerful strides closing the gap with terrifying speed. Bullets whizzed past, but it seemed invulnerable, shrugging off our shots like they were nothing. Fear surged through my veins as I ran, heart pounding in my chest. We needed to find cover and fast. We ducked behind some crates, desperately trying to catch our breath. The creature circled us, snarling, its sharp teeth glistening in the moonlight. It felt like an eternity, but eventually, we managed to escape. We made it back to our extraction point, battered and bruised, but with the most crucial evidence the photos. Our mission was complete, but the questions kept haunting us. What was that creature? What were the Russians doing with it? That night in Ecuador will forever be etched in my memory. The encounter with that monstrous creature, the rush of adrenaline, and the lingering mysteries left behind. It was like stepping into a real-life horror story, one that I'll never forget. And trust me, it's a story I won't be sharing around a campfire anytime soon. We thought we heard a woman screaming. That's why we went into the woods. It sounded like a woman plain as day. There had been a few stories about our property being cursed or haunted and every once in a while that lured out the teenagers. This was something different. This wasn't a joke. My brother grabbed his rifle and I grabbed a flashlight. Whatever was going on with her, the woman's blood-curdling screams meant something was wrong. It was safer to have a weapon on hand. We threw on our jackets and charged into the woods. The autumn chill still nipped at our faces, but we were determined to ignore the weather and to find whoever was out in those trees. They needed our help. Another shriek gave us our direction. We called to them. We made a lot of noise, hoping to guide the woman to us. But the closer we got, and the more we made ourselves known, the quieter the stranger became. The screaming was more spaced out. It faded into a sort of animalistic bleeding, then to a whimper. Then she was silent, and we were alone in the trees. We were sure she was there. We wondered if maybe someone or something had made her quiet down. We stupidly decided to split up. Looking back, that was the biggest mistake we could have made. What if the woman had run into trouble? We were just going to shoot our way out or bludgeon the problem with our flashlight. I don't know what we were thinking. I'll be the first to admit that. Hearing someone scared or hurt, hearing it coming from our family's property, we felt compelled to act. We never even considered the alternative. I wish now that we had. After all, it wasn't a woman in those woods. It was just a thing that sounded human. My first glimpse of it was a white flash crossing the beam of my flashlight. It looked like a horse or a cow, but it was moving too quickly for me to get a good look. The trees around me were too tightly spread for an animal that big to navigate them anyway. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. The next scream came from directly beside me. I jumped, turned, and tripped over my own legs. Fear quickly turned them into jello. I pedaled backward on my hands, sprawled like a crab on the ground. My flashlight had rolled away from me. When it came to rest, the beam was pointed directly at the thing screaming for our attention. It stood like a man, sure, but it couldn't have been one. Its body thick and muscular was covered head to toe in a smoke-white fur. 
The hair was short and curly, matted close to its body and speckled by leaves and dirt. Its eyes were wide and its jaw protruded from its face like an animal. It didn't have a nose as much as it had two bare nostrils that flared with every breath. Its broad shoulders climbed as it inhaled and watched me. Then it screamed again. I watched its lips peel back to reveal teeth that looked strangely human, arranged in some unnatural way to fit the monster's misshapen mouth. I crouched there, cowering in fear. My hands went up to cover my ears as my eyes began to close. Then the creature's wails were interrupted by a gunshot. You always can count on your siblings, can't you? I heard the bullet sail over my head. The monster gasped and sailed backward, spinning on the heels of its hoved feet. Its back crashed into a tree trunk and it soon crumpled to the ground. It fell out of the flashlight's beam. My brother yelled, asking if I could see it. I couldn't. I dove for the torch and raised it, trying to find the creature in the woods again. We both knew instinctively that the monster wasn't dead. It was too big for one bullet to do the job. I caught the flash of white again, this time stained red, disappearing into the midnight woods. We tried to chase it. Whatever it was, we couldn't let it linger on our property. We resolved to take the thing down and drag it into the light of day. Then we'd figure out what it was. We'd discover the truth behind the massive animal and keep it from scaring anyone else in the process. We picked up its blood trail. We followed it as closely as we could, but eventually it must have stopped bleeding. We recovered a patch of white fur on the tree it first crashed into, but that was the extent of our proof. We had a clump of fur and a frightening story. Neither the hair nor the details we shared convinced much of anyone of the thing in our woods. We tried to put a party together, a group that could track it over the course of a few days. No one wanted any part of monster hunting, go figure. That left the resolution up to us. We set traps. We camped out in the area we'd first seen it. We stayed up all hours of the night listening for the scream. It never came again. We never got another reason to go trekking into those woods. Maybe we were wrong and it only took one bullet after all. My brother and I doubt that. There would have been a body. There would have been remains to find and headlines to write. What we've got is nothing. Fur and a story. But it came to us recently. Maybe what we saw wasn't so one of a kind. Maybe someone else has seen the smoke white monster in another set of woods. Maybe near to us, who knows? Maybe in another state altogether. Have you seen it? Have you heard it? If so, you only need to say the word. Me and my brother came running once and we'd gladly do it again. Nobody should have to deal with that thing alone. My father wasn't a perfect man. I haven't forgotten the line nights, the loud arguments, or the empty bottles. But I do know, with the benefit of hindsight, that my father did his best. Once upon a time, he might have been good at it. Fatherhood. My mom used to think so. She used to talk about how excited he was when I was born. Then something changed. My mother, my siblings, and even I sometimes like to pretend that we couldn't remember what changed him. It was easier to tell ourselves that his mind or his heart had just shifted. He'd just become calloused, as tired men sometimes do. But we saw it. We saw what happened to him. How could we forget? It was 20 years ago now. I was young, still in grade school. We were living out in the rural Midwest, on a piece of property that used to be farmland. We couldn't keep up with it. It didn't feel like a loss, admitting that we weren't farmers. Our family made money in other ways and we did all right financially. What we did miss out on, however, was neighbors. The closest one was miles away. That meant when the night came, we didn't have any witnesses. We were the only ones who could have possibly believed our story. Of course, we did our best to forget it. We were happier pretending they never came. Who wants to live their life afraid of the sky itself? I remember the dry thunder of that summer season. 
It sounded like the sky was splitting apart as my siblings and I began the bedtime routine of brushing our teeth and avoiding our parents. If they didn't see us right away, sometimes we'd get to stay up an entire half hour before they made us turn the lights out. You had a routine like that too, right? Anyway, we failed. We were spotted early and we found ourselves in the dark soon enough. It would have been easy to sleep. The thunder made it easy, if it wasn't for the lights that appeared just a few minutes later. They burst in through the windows, burning through our blinds as if the fabric wasn't even there. It was suddenly daylight in our room. We ran, confused and frightened, downstairs to meet our parents. Mom stopped us before we could get too far. Dad was already outside. He always told us that one day the soy production plant at the edge of the nearest town might explode. When he told that story, he made it sound like the explosion would be our own little nuclear bomb. That's what I was imagining as I watched my father's silhouette through the front doorway. He was walking into nuclear territory. The lights changed colors and began to swirl. Suddenly it sounded like we were under one constant drone of thunder. I wonder now if the lights had been using the storm as cover, or had they created the storm themselves? It was the perfect camouflage, wasn't it? None of us knew what was coming. We could see our dad in the front lawn. He was looking up, arms down at his sides. He hadn't run out there to play hero, chasing off the invaders on his property. He was in awe. We all were. Then he disappeared. The lights blinked out of existence. The thunder stopped, and Dad was gone. There was an empty spot on the grass where his silhouette had last been. One by one, we wandered out there to search for him. He was nowhere to be found. Our mother called the police and they searched too, but they didn't believe our story about the thunder and the lights. They left as all empty-handed and empty-hearted. None of us went back to bed. Two days later, after we ran dry of tears, Dad came back. He was disoriented and dehydrated, but hardly worse for wear. He downed two full glasses of water and went back to living as normal. When we told him two days had passed, he froze. He swallowed something heavy in his throat, then he scoffed. He let it roll off his back like that encounter was just another night. He had nightmares after that. Screamed sometimes, waking up the whole house. I didn't envy my mother, sleeping beside him. He grew distant. He talked less. You've seen somebody shut themselves off before, haven't you? One day they're there, and the next day they're just not. The body's still moving, but the mind's somewhere else. That was what happened to our father. There wasn't much we could do to change it, except talk some more with law enforcement and local doctors. We wanted to help him, and we wanted to know what happened that night. None of them were any use. Most, as a matter of fact, turned us away. Even the doctors who said they'd take our insurance got cold feet. Sometimes it seemed like they wanted to help and then they just wouldn't. It was like somebody was pulling their leash, you know? They'd try to reach out to us, they'd get real close and then the world would yank them back. Maybe they were just scared. Maybe someone told them not to help. I'll never know the truth of that. What I do know is that my father did his best and no other family should have to deal with what we endured. Nobody deserves that, least of all the ones who disappear. Because it's happened to others, you know? It's happened to other people that nobody wants to believe. I guess it requires a certain sacrifice, admitting that there's something unknowable out there. If we hadn't faced it, maybe we'd feel the same way. For now, I just want to warn you, some people say that these things, when they show up, they're absolutely silent. That wasn't what we encountered. Sometimes they come in the thunder. I am a 20-year veteran in the Forest Service. I've worked as a ranger for 12 years. In all my time working for the government, I mostly never encountered anything too out of the ordinary. That is until my last station job as a ranger at Gooseberry Falls State Park in Minnesota. It was quite possibly one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had while on duty, and certainly not something I'll ever forget. To explain how it happened, we need to go back about six months, before the incident occurred, 
I had been planning on retiring, but my son had just graduated college and was looking to move closer to Minneapolis. He asked me if he could work part-time with me while he looked for a full-time position, so I decided to pass up retirement and stay on the job. By the way, I should make a note that this was all pre-COVID. I had heard rumors of management positions opening up in the area. So after discussing it with him, we both agreed that he would come back home for around six months while he hoped for the perfect job to present itself. I was first introduced to Gooseberry Falls State Park during my orientation as a ranger there, and they took us out into the park at nighttime. It was an amazing sight, getting to see all these bright campfires down below from way above on top of the waterfalls. The rocks from the falls are very smooth and slippery due to years and years of erosion. You have to be careful if you want to climb down to view the falls at night. Our group had just finished our tour and was going to head back towards our cars when one of my co-workers, Tom, suggested that we climb down the falls. Just, you know, for the sake of it. I agreed, but we should have known better. And so did a handful of others who were nearby. As soon as we began climbing down, I sensed something wasn't right. But not wanted to look like I chickened out, I pushed those feelings aside as nothing more than nerves. It started out easy, everyone traveling downward in a single file behind each other, staying close and yet far enough apart for safety's sake. Then, around three quarters of the way down, things began to get a bit more dangerous. Tom fell. I didn't see him go down, but I heard the commotion. One of my other co-workers had seen what had happened, yelling up to us that he needed help getting Tom back up the rocks. Two guys rushed down to assist in whatever way they could. And while Tom was being helped back up, one of my female friends called out for help above him, saying she was slipping. It turns out that one part of the path she had been on had given way underneath and sent her tumbling downward. While this may have been scary in and of itself, what happened next could only be described as something straight from a horror movie. We were all standing there in shock at what had just happened when I heard the sound of movement above. I looked up, and there at the top of the ridge was this figure with long dark hair watching us. It was terrifying. It was all in black and had these faint yellow glowing eyes. It was in that moment that I felt my entire body give way, as if I suddenly lost control. The next thing I knew, I too was falling down to the ground below me. Everybody rushed over to help save me and one guy managed to grab hold of my hand while another wrapped his arms around one leg for whatever little good that did. They tried pulling me back up but there was no use. I looked down below and I could see there were people trying to help Tom, though they weren't having much success. I felt then that there was a possibility that we were going to die right there on those rocks if somebody didn't do something fast. That's when I remember the park ranger telling us about one of the waterfalls in this area being called Lucifer Falls. But for some reason nobody had ever been able to locate it if they ever climbed down to view it at night. It was said that once you get close enough you could hear voices, supposedly spirits whispering your name from below. Now. What is most troubling about this story is not so much what happened to me and my co-workers, but what happened with Tom and the female friend. As they were being pulled back up to safety, before either of them could make it out of the water completely, we noticed that their eyes had turned from their normal state into a solid black. It was at this moment that my two co-workers realized that the people they were struggling to help weren't actually Tom or the girl. I'll never forget hearing one of the others in the group scream as he pointed downwards towards, well, whatever it was that our friends had turned into. And yet another guy who was just in front of Tom and his girlfriend jumped back down into the water below to avoid capture. We watched them swim off in the opposite direction, but by this time there was nothing we could do to save them. We never did find out what happened to any of them after that day. I can only assume they were captured and are now being used as some sort of test subjects or something by these demonic creatures. Just looking at my own hands now I can still see the scars on them from that day. 
That's why I'm warning you all not to venture down this path at night. As a matter of fact, it might be best just to stay away from these woods entirely during nighttime hours, like we should have. Whatever it is that inhabits these lands does not seem too keen on having people wandering around here at night. But if you do, be careful, for you may soon find that the woods themselves can't tell the difference between friend and foe. Next up is an email I received from Travis. Travis's story goes all the way back to when he was hiking in the Appalachian Mountains back in 2015. His plan was to go camping by himself out in the backcountry, but was worried about not being able to find a suitable place. But he still just wanted to go ahead at the trailhead and hike around and see what he could find. Maybe he could make a makeshift campsite with only his small tent and at least squeeze in a night or two versus figuring out a week-long stay like he had originally planned. The weather was perfect, light winds about 50 or so degrees and partly cloudy, enough for him to enjoy a lovely camping trip. At this point, he had been hiking for probably about three or four hours and did not see anybody else on the trail. Apparently that wasn't uncommon for the area since the further you get out on this specific trail, it's much more secluded from civilization. As he continued his trek, he notices something very odd in the forest, and that is the fact that everything around him had begun to grow eerily quiet, besides his own footsteps crunching over twigs and leaves along the trail. And what's also interesting is that this portion of the trail is thick with underbrush on both sides, and usually, at least all throughout the morning, he couldn't hear birds singing or wildlife erupting with noise and life. It's as if they had all fled or just seemed to be hiding and keeping low. The deeper into the woods he traversed, the more eerie things became, and the more his hairs on the back of his neck began to prickle like something was wrong. And the more he realized that it's like every living creature had vacated this part of nature. He hated to think about it, but all he could envision was rats leaving a sinking ship. At this point, he felt almost in a fishbowl in a sense, even though he was completely alone and hadn't seen anybody on the trail that day. He felt as though the woods were watching him, and every so often he would hear what sounded like footsteps crunching through the forest behind him, almost as if someone was tailing him. And every time he turned around to investigate, there was no one there. It was as if he was being stalked by some invisible entity. After some time, his paranoia grew stronger, and he couldn't take it anymore. He turned around and began to head back towards the trailhead, hoping to put as much distance between himself and whatever was out there. He walked faster, almost jogging back towards the trailhead, and as he did, he felt a sudden gust of wind behind him, as if something was right on his heels. He turned around and saw nothing, but the feeling persisted, and it only intensified his fear. He picked up his pace and finally reached the trailhead, relieved to be out of the woods. But as he turned to look back one last time, he saw a figure standing among the trees, barely visible and staring at him. The figure was tall and slender, with long arms and an unnaturally elongated neck. The figure's eyes glowed with an intense light, and Travis could feel its gaze piercing through him. He quickly turned away and got into his car, driving off as fast as he could, leaving the Appalachian Mountains behind him. Travis's encounter in the Appalachian Mountains left him deeply shaken, and he couldn't explain what he had seen. He didn't dare to return to those woods again, and he warned others to stay away as well. To this day, he believes he came face to face with something supernatural, something that lurks in the depths of the Appalachian Mountains. I've been following your show for a while now, and I figured it's about time I shared an experience of my own. I can hardly believe it myself. It happened in my first year on the job as a park ranger in the depths of the Everglades. One night, on my usual patrol, I saw something bizarre. I was on my usual patrol, walking around with my flashlight, checking on the wildlife and ensuring campers were settled. Suddenly I noticed something near the water's edge. 
At first I figured it was just another gator. We see plenty of them in the park. But as I moved closer, I realized this was something entirely different. It was a figure, around seven feet tall, hunched over like it was examining something on the ground. The creature was covered in scales, kind of a greenish color that shivered slightly in the beam of my flashlight. It had long arms, longer than any human's, ending in what looked like claws. The sight was disturbingly abnormal. Its head was strange too, like a cross between an alligator's and a human's, round but with those reptilian features. I called out, not sure why, maybe in a vain hope that it was a prankster in a costume. But the reaction I got still gives me chills. The creature turned to face me, and its eyes, they were just wrong. They glowed in the flashlight, bright yellow with slits for pupils, just like a reptile. I was rooted to the spot, my mind racing to make sense of what I was seeing. Before I could gather my wits, the creature slipped silently into the water, leaving me standing there in the silent fog. The next day, when I shared my story with the other rangers, they laughed it off, suggesting it was the product of a long night and an overactive imagination. But I couldn't just forget what I'd seen. So I began digging through the park's old records and found similar sightings dating back decades. Descriptions of the same reptilian humanoid, the same eerie eyes, the same silent disappearance. This left me with a strange cocktail of emotions. I was relieved to find I wasn't alone in my sighting, but it was unnerving to think there might be some truth in what I saw. Ever since on my patrols, even though I've never encountered the creature again, I often feel watched. The feeling is strongest by the water's edge where I first saw it. It's a prickling sensation, the sense of unseen eyes tracking my movement. Anyway, that's my story. I know it might sound far-fetched, but I promise you, I couldn't make this up even if I tried. I would like to add one more thing about this creature's power. I've seen countless gators in my time here. I've seen them hunt, fight, and assert their dominance over the waterways. The sheer size of it was one thing. It towered at about seven feet tall, significantly bigger than even the largest gators we get in these parts. And its arms, they were thick and muscular, like it could snap a tree branch in half without breaking a sweat. There was a grace to its movements too, an eerie floridity that seemed both alien and yet eerily familiar. While a gator possesses a primal raw strength, this creature seemed to radiate a calculated power. It moved with purpose and intelligence. The way it slipped into the water, barely causing a ripple despite its size, it suggested a creature perfectly adapted to its environment and possibly at the top of the food chain. No gator, no matter how large or ferocious, has ever given me the chills the way this creature did. Its presence seemed to silence the marsh around us, and even after it disappeared, it took a while for the sounds of the swamp to return. Hey there, I've been tuning into your channel for a bit now. I've always been intrigued by your stories, how they all seem to be these random encounters with the supernatural. But let me tell you about my own experience. You could call me a researcher, I suppose, but I'm no academic. I'm just a regular guy who's always had a fascination with the unexplained. I've spent the better part of my life chasing after these mysteries and it took me 20 years until I had the encounter I'm about to share with you. I was on a trip with my son, visiting Louisiana. We were exploring the swamps, far away from the hustle and bustle of New Orleans. We'd heard rumors of a strange creature lurking in these parts, something the locals referred to as the Rougarou. Now I'm not one to believe in tall tales, but there was something about these stories that piqued my interest. We'd been out in the swamps for a few days, following up on these rumors. We hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary, just the usual swamp wildlife. But then, one evening, things took a turn. We were sitting by our campfire, just about to turn in for the night, when we heard a rustling in the undergrowth. Now, I've been camping enough times to know the sounds of the night, but this, this was different. 
It was heavier, slower, like something big was moving around out there. I grabbed my flashlight and shone it towards the noise. For a moment, all we saw were the shadows of the trees, but then something moved, something big. It was just a silhouette, but it was enough to make my heart skip a beat. I could see it was tall, standing on two legs with broad shoulders. It looked more like a man than any animal I'd ever seen. My son was scared, I could tell, but I told him to stay quiet, to stay still. We watched as the creature moved slowly around our camp, always staying just out of the light. It circled us a few times, then disappeared back into the swamp. We didn't sleep much that night, as you can imagine. The next day we were on high alert. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig had us jumping, but the swamp was quiet, eerily so. It was as if the whole world was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. Then the next evening, out of the silence, we heard it. A low growl, guttural and primal. It sent a chill down my spine. I grabbed my flashlight again, my hand shaking just a bit. I shone the light towards the sound, my heart pounding in my chest. And there it was again. The creature. It was closer now, close enough for us to make out details. It was covered in thick, matted fur, dark as the night around us. Its eyes reflected the light from my flashlight, glowing an eerie yellow. It had a snout, like a dog or a wolf, but its body was more human-like. Muscular arms ended in clawed hands, and its posture was hunched, as if it was ready to pounce. I knew it was the Rougarou, the creature from the stories. Seeing it up close in the flesh was both terrifying and fascinating. It was a creature of legend, a myth come to life, and it was standing right in front of us. The Rougarou didn't make any aggressive moves. It just watched us, its eyes never leaving ours. It was almost as if it was curious, studying us just as we were studying it. We were in its territory, guests in its home, and it was deciding what to do with us. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone. It turned and disappeared into the swamp, leaving us alone in the silence once more. We were left with the crackling of our fire and the pounding of our hearts. We didn't speak of it for the rest of the trip. It was as if we were both trying to process what we had seen, but there was no making sense of it. We had come face to face with a legend, with a creature that shouldn't exist, but it did. We had seen it with our own eyes. That encounter changed us, changed how we saw the world. It was a reminder that there are still mysteries out there, still things that defy explanation. And as terrifying as it was, I wouldn't change a thing. It was an experience, a story that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. I attend college in Boston, and as you might know, the place is full of stories about the great American road trip. We got the Route 66, cross-country tours, national parks, all of it. But you kind of get used to it, really. I never really took it seriously and felt that most of it's for show, for the tourists. I figured as a student I was above all that. I knew what to believe and what not to. Not like the folks driving around in their RVs gawking at landmarks. That was before I turned 20, finished my sophomore year and decided to take a summer road trip across the US. I work part time at a library on campus, so I wanted to do something different but I wasn't sure I'd be able to afford it. The road is long, but it has a certain charm, and if you work during the school year, it's much easier to afford a trip when you don't have to worry about classes. I figured it was worth a try, though, and I got online to plan. When I saw the cost of this used van on Craigslist, I thought maybe it was a typo because it was so low. I figured I had nothing to lose, so I called. The seller seemed weirdly happy that I'd called, so I thought the van must be a total clunker. I agreed to meet him at his place the next day, though. He also seemed insistent that we do it before it got dark. He kept reminding me not to be late. So after work the next day, I drove over there. The van was parked in a lot full of used cars and trucks. And RVs? The van was a classic Volkswagen. 
I don't want to say the color, but it's kind of a hippie symbol. The type of vehicle that screens road trip and has bumper stickers from all over the country. You had to climb in through the side door to get into it. Once you were in there, though, it was cozy. Comfortable seats, wooden interior, just enough space for one person to sleep. An older stove in the back, but that was fine. I didn't cook much. The back window looked out onto a nice view of wherever you parked. I liked it and gave him a verbal commitment, but the seller couldn't take my cash quick enough. I wondered if he had a gambling problem or something because he seemed to need that money pretty bad. I drove off a few days later and everything was fine. It's an old van, like a lot of them on the road, so the engine kind of groaned and I couldn't use too many appliances at once or the fuse would trip, but that was okay. That first night, though, I had a weird urge to buy a camera. I don't take photos, but that Polaroid at the corner store called my name. I didn't want to because that stuff's not cheap. When I got back, I was going to put it in the cabinet, but something told me to put it on the dashboard. Something like almost a voice. Almost, but not enough to scare me. Not yet. Over the next few days, I started noticing an extra photo in the morning. I don't always remember taking pictures, and a lot of times I meet people on the road or just stop at a scenic spot. So I wasn't really sure. Did we take four photos last night or three? After a week, I decided I'd make sure the camera was empty before I went to bed, just to see. Sure enough, in the morning, there was a photo on the dashboard. I'd forgotten about the Polaroid. I finally put the two together and checked the film. It was half empty. I started to freak out. Who was taking photos at night? Why? I made sure all the doors and windows were locked, but it still happened. Someone must have a key, I figured. I listened, but didn't hear anything. Yet the photos kept appearing and the film level got lower. I finally set up a camera pointed at the dashboard. It would have to pick up whoever was doing this. By this point I was terrified and my hands were shaking the next morning when I checked the footage. It showed nothing, but the photo was still there. I watched it over and over, but I didn't see anything. Finally I turned the volume up as high as it would go and I heard something like a voice on the video, but I couldn't understand what it was saying. I thought about calling the police, but I didn't want anyone thinking I was crazy. I decided to go to the local diner instead. Waitresses have heard it all, right? I ordered a coffee and asked the waitress what she knew about the van. She said she's only been working at the diner for a year, so she doesn't know the whole story, but she heard a guy was found dead in a similar van after a road trip. Since then, no one has bought the van for more than a couple of months, she said. Most people just sell it, leave the memories and move on. I asked her what she could tell me about the guy and she said supposedly he used to travel a lot. Photography? I asked. She said, yeah, how do you know? Hey there, my name's Jack. A buddy of mine suggested I share my story with you. I've been hesitant to talk about it, but I guess it's time to put it all out there. So this all kicked off during my trip to Canada. I was visiting my old college friend Mike, who had settled down in Vancouver. We decided to take a trip to the Canadian Rockies, a place I'd always wanted to see. We had planned a whole week of hiking, fishing, and just soaking in the natural beauty. One evening after a long day of hiking, we returned to our cabin and realized we really wished we'd had some cold beers to drink by the fire. I volunteered to drive to the little shop down the road and fetch some. It was pretty dark, and I was navigating with my high beams on. As I was driving, I noticed a strange light in the distance, over the mountains, but it was hard to make out with my lights being so bright. It sorts of looked like a searchlight, but there was no sound of a helicopter or anything. I found it odd, but I continued towards the store. Then, within the next few minutes, I saw it alongside the road up ahead. This figure. At first, I thought it was a man, but something about it was off. It was too tall, too thin, and its head was disproportionately large. Its body was frail, and its eyes were an intense black. Despite the alarm bells ringing in my head, I felt an inexplicable pull towards it. As I approached the figure, my heart began to race, 
and a sense of unease washed over me. The creature stood motionless, its elongated limbs dangling loosely by its sides. Its skin, if it could even be called that, appeared translucent, revealing a network of pulsating veins that glowed with an otherworldly blue hue. The creature's head turned slowly, as if it was studying me with those piercing black eyes. It was unnerving, as if it could see right through me into the deepest recesses of my soul. A shiver ran down my spine, and I fought the urge to slam on the brakes and speed away from this bizarre encounter. But my curiosity outweighed my fear, and I cautiously rolled down the window to get a better look. As soon as the window opened, a gust of cold wind rushed into the car, carrying with it an acrid scent that made my nose scrunch in discomfort. The creature's head tilted to the side, almost as if it was mimicking human curiosity. It emitted a low, guttural sound that sent a chill down my spine. The strange light I had seen earlier continued to hover above the mountains, casting an eerie glow over the surrounding landscape. The air crackled with an inexplicable energy, and I felt a tingling sensation spreading through my body. Without warning, the creature extended one of its bony fingers towards me. Its touch was icy and sent a jolt of electricity through my veins. I could barely breathe as an overwhelming sense of dread consumed me. In that moment, I realized that this encounter was far from ordinary. It wasn't just some chance encounter with a strange being. It felt like an encounter with something beyond our comprehension, something extraterrestrial. As the seconds stretched into an eternity, I mustered the courage to break free from the creature's gaze. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, my heart pounding in my chest. The tires screeched as I accelerated away from the creature and the inexplicable phenomenon that surrounded it. Breathing heavily, I stole a quick glance in the rearview mirror. The creature stood there, its dark eyes still fixed on me, but it made no attempt to follow. It remained an enigmatic presence in the darkness, a haunting memory etched into my mind. I finally reached the store, bought the beer, and raced back to the cabin. I stumbled out of the car, my legs weak with both relief and lingering fear. I relayed the encounter to Mike, who listened intently, his eyes wide with disbelief. We spent the rest of the night discussing theories and possibilities, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Years have passed since that fateful night in the Canadian Rockies, but the memory of that encounter still lingers within me. It serves as a reminder that there are mysteries in this vast universe that we may never fully understand that there are creatures and phenomena beyond the realm of human comprehension. Perhaps one day, the truth will reveal itself, and the enigma of that creature and the strange light in the mountains will be unraveled. But until then, it remains an unforgettable chapter in my life. A story that I share with others as a cautionary tale of the unknown, lurking just beyond the edges of our perception. Park rangers are experiencing bizarre, unexplainable phenomena. Some deem it as supernatural, while others see it as just completely unexplainable. The story I'm going to share highlights just some of the mystery. This story was submitted to me by a gentleman who referred to himself as Jason. Jason went on to tell me in his email that all this occurred between 2005 and 2009 in a national park. He wished and requested to remain anonymous but informed me that it's okay to tell you that it is in the northern section of the United States. What's interesting about Jason's story is that he brings forth information about a search and rescue mission. They found a body posed about 40 feet up in a pine tree with wounds that were physically impossible for a bear to make. However, it was written down as a bear kill. After all, bears attacking and killing humans isn't necessarily new. But to write off these bizarre events as a simple bear kill, something just isn't adding up. Jason explained that for a while now, months before this even happened, he and his colleagues were hearing and experiencing strange things all around the park. They witnessed mysterious phenomena, mysterious black apparitions appearing out of the corner of their eyes, 
and strange lights and sounds appearing all over the park at all times of the day. But they mostly didn't talk about it, or very infrequently it would come up in casual conversation. However, it's not something you're going to outright report to your superiors, and for good reason. For a while now, visitors across the park had been complaining about strange, disturbing noises. From humans screaming and yelling to strange, unexplainable animal sounds, all coming from the backcountry area of the forest in the park. But when investigated by rangers and staff at the park, there was no trace of anything. No track, and no evidence of anybody being back there. It's as if these sounds simply manifested on their own, and vanished when anybody would show curiosity to inspect what was happening. Apparently, some of Jason's closest colleagues and people he worked with had some strange experiences while in this small section of the backwoods. Although they refused to talk about it, every time it was brought up casually, they seemed to go pale and act scared, as if they knew something but were too afraid to talk about it. Now this puzzled Jason. Keep in mind that these particular events I'm explaining now happened before the search and rescue where the body was found, posed up in a tree and assumed to be, or at least written down as, a bear kill. Other reports had come in that Jason dealt with personally. In these backcountry campsites, food and supplies were being taken. But it was easily written off because animals can steal food and supplies and the human noises or sounds could easily be written off and explained as foxes and mountain lions at nighttime. Then Jason goes on to tell of a more harrowing experience. This was, of course, after the search and rescue find of the body. Some personnel were growing concerned because they believed they had a bear accustomed to human food on their hands, and it would only prove could be dangerous. However, upon venturing back further, they found what appeared to be a den of some kind, not that of a bear. One of Jason's closest colleagues also reported strange sounds like a mechanical humming in the woods right near where this den was. It was around this same den where he spotted strange tracks that he could not quite identify. In fact, they looked more akin to that of a goat track, but did not resemble any animal he is familiar with. For the following few days, they would spend time hiking throughout this small valley where a bizarre, pervasive odor of death crept up on them. In this same evening, while they were at their campsite, they experienced a series of strange events that would occur over the course of the night. One of them reported strange whispers and hushed tones right near the tent, along with some strange gurgling noises like somebody gargling on blood. As Jason recalls, one of these park rangers ventured out beyond the reaches of his tent and the safety of the flashlight, armed with a rifle to investigate the source of these strange noises. There was some moonlight giving brief illumination to the area around him. But even though he could see off into the woodlands and was shining and scanning with his flashlight, he didn't capture anything. But there were a few moments where he swore that he could see a very tall, skinny silhouette watching him from the tree line, a silhouette that unmistakably was not a bear in any way, shape, or form. What's also strange is the ever-pervading odor of death in this whole valley. The rangers who had made note of it noticed that any time the strange occurrences happened, whether it be sights or smells or phenomena, this odor of death would increase tenfold. They explained it to Jason, who related to me as this. Imagine standing next to a cow carcass that had been dead for three to four days, baking in the hot sun. That would be enough to make you gag. But there was no visible source for this odor to be coming from, especially not as strong and as potent as this smell was. The following day, they all returned to the main portion of the camp with no signs or evidence to further validate what the source of the noises were. This only complicated things more as everybody was so perplexed at their findings. While everybody was creeped out, nobody was about to go ahead and point fingers and call it a boogeyman. If you want to keep your credibility, that's not something you even hint at in a professional setting. What's also very interesting is that the same day in October, Two hikers would end up missing around the same area where they heard those noises the previous night in that same valley. Jason, 
who was now involved in a search party to find these two missing hikers, experienced a series of unexplainable events, sounds, and phenomena. These events further validated the experiences of his two fellow colleagues just days before. While the two missing hikers were never found, and are still considered several of the missing persons cases today, the experiences that Jason recalls were completely bone-chilling. Once he had discovered these human remains high in the tree, he didn't really tell me via email all the details, but he followed the appropriate protocol to have the body properly taken care of. But they could not identify who the body belonged to, and there had been no reports in the general time frame of anybody gone missing. So, the hiker was simply a Jane Doe. The problem was not so much the body and the missing person who it belonged to. It was more so the condition in which the body was found. Jason shared with me some pretty disturbing descriptions of how the body was found, and I'm not going to share every little detail. But I will say that the body was badly mangled in a way that did not classify as a wolf or a bear or a mountain lion kill. The body was hardly eaten on but primarily just disfigured, as if something had used this person as its plaything and mangled this corpse. There were even bizarre bite marks taken out of it that did not fit a canine of any kind or a bear or a mountain lion, coyote, fox, or anything falling under the carnivorous or omnivore category. Nothing matched up, not even the teeth marks. Nobody could really figure it out. So this was yet another case written down as simply a bear kill. Even Jason, who had found the body originally, tried his best to rationalize the find as somebody having a very unfortunate run-in with a bear. But with how badly mangled this person was, which bears do not do, it did not line up with the way a bear kills. I'll let you guys be the judge on this and let you guys speculate. Could this have been something supernatural? Does this have any connection at all to the thing chasing Jason at night or the experience the other two park rangers had in the valley? Or is this simply just a misidentification of an unfortunate individual being slaughtered by a bear? Those are just about all the details Jason left me. So, I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments below for this particular story. What do you think happened? Is it real? Was there something truly supernatural? Or is there simply a way to rationally explain it all with critical thinking?